Tonight's episode of Astonishing Legends is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus, Squarespace, Quip, ZipRecruiter, and our contributors at Patreon. This is the final part of our series on Gobekli Tepe. Time to start looking deeper into what this place might have been. We've thoroughly explored the science behind the dig, but now, even though the hard evidence is scant, well-researched speculation abounds about what Gobekli Tepe was built for. And as that speculation unfolds, one can't help but feel like we are looking behind the curtain at the origins of the civilized part of human existence. While we can never really know what was on the minds of these people that lived nearly 12,000 years ago, we do have one irrefutable thing in common with them. They were human beings. They were us. This must count for something, something decidedly unscientific, the idea that we all understand each other better than we think we do, even when separated by millennia. Author Andrew Collins wrote in his book, Gebekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, that he wondered if there may be a connection between the Book of Enoch and the tales of the Watchers and Gebekli itself. Tonight we'll explore that idea and many others as we dig down further into the strata of the world's oldest temple. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Many people say I believe aliens built the pyramids. I don't. In fact, I'm not a supporter of the ancient alien hypothesis at all. I think a lost human civilization is a much better explanation of the mysteries and paradoxes of ancient cultures. Graham Hancock, author. Join us tonight for the final part of our series on the oldest known temple in the world, Gobekli Tepe. And we're back. Yes, we are. Uh, Forrest, I was meaning to ask you, did you get one of our cool new coffee mugs, the ones that came in last week? No, I mean, we saw them, you know, we, I mean, we, we ordered them. I was going to set one aside or, or place an order right now, actually, for myself. Uh, why? They're gone. <laughs> They're all, what? every single one of them, gone. They were in the store for like two days, right? Yeah, more than that, like four or five, but yeah. Jeez, you know, and we had like 150 too, right, of, of each one? Ah, yeah, we used to. Oh. They're all being packed up and shipped out now. They're sold out. Wow. Every single one of them. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, so Both much colors. for, uh, you know, being owners of whatever this is. <laughs> you can't even get your own mug. <laughs> well, you know, it's lonely at the top. Well, and then there's nothing to put my coffee in now, so I'm extra <laughs> sad. Or Irish coffee, whatever, either of the two. Whatever you want to put in there, can't do it now. Yeah, yeah you can't do it. Uh, yeah. Or we can't do it. But 150 lucky people can. So I guess you guys have figured out the new mugs are sold out. We have reordered them much more in a higher quantity, and we should have them in a couple of weeks with any luck. We will, of course, keep you posted, but thank you so much for all of your orders. I mean, wow. Yeah, no, thank you so much. That's a great problem to have, as they say. Uh, We're (laughs) kind of blown away, but they are kind of cool. I'll give you that. They're very cool. Two other event reminders quickly here. We will both be in Atchison, Kansas for the Amelia Earhart Festival, July 18th through the 21st, courtesy of the Chasing Earhart Project. During that week, we're having a meet and greet at the local Elks Lodge, and we'll also be on a Chasing Earhart panel with many other distinguished guests, much, much more distinguished than us, of course, (laughs) on July 21st. So you want to be there for that if you can. Yeah, and here's the awesome thing about that meet and greet he just mentioned. Chris Williamson at Chasing Earhart pointed out to us that Aaron and Justin, the guys behind the Generation Y podcast, are based only an hour away. So now the fan meet and greet is one for both Astonishing Legends and Generation Y. That's going to be Thursday, July 19th at 8 p.m. at the Atchison, Kansas Elks Lodge number 647. Which, by the way, is haunted. It's haunted by elks. Large elks, yeah. you got to get out of their way. (laughs) This is not a ticketed event, but RSVPs are requested via our main Facebook page. If you have access to Facebook, that will help us keep track of the headcount. Yes, and remember, I'm going solo for the first annual Pottern Love Convention in New Orleans this year. Or Nolans. Or New Orleans, depending on how you want to say it. And that is a convention for podcast listeners by podcast listeners, and it's brought to you by our friends over at Podcast We Listen To, which is both a Facebook group and a podcast itself. Actually, Scott and I were guests on there like a month or two ago, 
Uh, so go please check that out. Oh, yeah. And I think that was the first time of all the shows they've had on there. That was the first time he was forced into a two-part series. <laughs> we managed off. to pull that off. Well, as we uh, <laughs> said afterwards, uh, Jeremy did not know what he was in for. We tend to <laughs> fill up uh, hard drives until they're unusable. So, <laughs> yeah, which we did with him. He was a great host. It was a lot of fun talking with him. But that's the spirit of the convention, Potter and Love. It's really just for people like us who love to listen to podcasts, who love to be on podcasts, and love interacting uh, with both. So it's going to be a great time. Anyway, that is August 10th through the 12th. So go check it out at the website, which is podern, P-O-D-E-R-N dot love, L-O-V-E, and you'll get all the information you want. All right. It's time to wrap this Gebekli Tepa series up. Yes, actually, uh, this whole series feels like it's been 10,000 years in the making. <laughs> but, but here's the <laughs> we deal. Started it, we started it when they first abandoned the site. <laughs> but just, just the research and the reading and then just the retelling of it. But I'll tell you what, this now is going to be the fun part. So before we get started, this reminds me of some stuff that Dr. Klein over at The Great Courses Plus said about what Gebekli Tepe is not in his brief discussion of, <laughs> yeah. of GT. Well, he's he's trying to clear up and dispel some myths that happen quite a bit in archaeology because finds are made and people want to jump to, what is this? Tell us right away. Be definitive. Give us an answer. This is so fascinating. And the answer is, we know to a certain point. And it's going to be a long process of discovery. And this is the feeling that I get at some point. There is a a part of the Rubicon you don't want to cross with interpretation of what this is, is that we can only go so far depending on the camp that you're in. Now, I want to address why we explained the terms processual and post-processual archaeology and why it seemed to get kind of academic, because this is an academic subject. It's how we look at things like this. It's the only tools we have rather than just wild conjecture. So the reason uh, we went and explained it is because there's two major schools of thought in how we look at these things and how we interpret them, what we find at these places. And in the old days, as we discussed in part two, is like you find these things, you, you describe them with quote-unquote, thick description, which is just, what did you find? Well, a piece of pottery had this design on it. And then we don't really know, but it looks like a, a guy getting eaten by an alligator. And that's it. You don't question why. And it stops there. But as archaeology has progressed over the years and generations, the ideas of how we should talk about archaeology and what we find have changed a little, and ideas and perceptions along with them. And also, very passionate arguments about what should be included and what should not be included in the discussion and interpretation of things we find. So that's the explanation. And, you know, when we talked about Dr. Klein, you know, I believe firmly he's in the camp of, I wouldn't classify him, I don't want to label him as a processualist, but basically he's just standard, solid, firm ground archaeology, I guess mainstream. What what do we know versus... What is speculation? And that's a very cautious and prudent and uh, solid stance to be on. It's like, this is what we found. This is what the image may represent based on what we found in similar areas and uh, other discoveries that have been made, and we can make connections there. So when he explains, you know, what a vulture painting looks like it's representing, it's based on, you know, years of discoveries of other symbols and those interpreted meanings and from other cultures. But there's a point where he's not going to go beyond. Here's a stopping point for him. And so, as we said in part two, he wanted to stress very clearly what he does not think Gebekli Tepe is. And he wanted to stress that to everyone watching and that it is not the Garden of Eden. It has nothing to do to an ancient site related to the Watchers or ancient Nephilim from the Bible And it has nothing to do with a global catastrophe. Because in his mind, and I think a lot of archaeologists would agree in the mainstream and of that camp, that we just don't know. There's no evidence for any of that. So anything that you postulate about catastrophes or connections to biblical stories or local legends or even things that you found in other cultures, we can't go there. It's shaky ground. There's no basis to make those leaps. So they're going to stand firmly in more of what we know and what is obvious there. And as we said, the main man of this uh, whole project, Klaus Schmidt, 
the guy who dedicated his life, really. I love a phrase that uh, was in that book and that he knew at that moment, as he described it, that I could turn around and walk away. And if I do, I can kind of forget this or make a note of it. If I stay here and study this, I'll be here for the rest of my life. Yeah. Because it's such a deep, fascinating, engrossing, engaging kind of place. He knew this is it. If I embark on this journey, I'm going to see it through. And that's what he did. But Klaus Schmidt, being the man uh, who knew this place best, you could say, made some interpretations that were educated guesses or speculations. But if there's anybody who's going to do it, that's the guy who should be doing it. And maybe he he did go a few meters further than most archaeologists would who've worked or studied, but it was nothing too outrageous. He did wonder, though, and I'm firmly also in his camp of, yeah, why not wonder? Why spend over 10 years of your life there and not try and piece together this puzzle and make an, an announcement of it? Yeah, I mean, you can't state anything definitively, but he did wonder. I think he put questions out there, which should be looked at. So I applaud him for that, no matter what camp you're in. That which brings us to the next and last phase of our series here. This would typically be the conclusions episode, although we are not educated well enough to make the conclusions here. So we're (laughs) going to draw on other people's guesses. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, we're going to make some guesses (laughs) at the very end, but we're going to draw on other people's observations. One of the people that we are most specifically going to talk about, who we've already talked about a great deal, is um, the author Andrew Collins. And Andrew Collins wrote this book, which. So a couple of professors, including Dr. Klein, specifically (laughs) obliquely referred to a book that came out in 2014. Right. He says uh, it's not any of the things essentially that were claimed, you know, in in a a certain book that came out in 2014. (laughs) 2014. Well, that book, which we really want to talk about, this book is pretty amazing, I got to say. And it's called Gebekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods. And then the subtitle is The Temple of the Watchers and the discovery of Eden. So right there on the front, it's putting all the cards on the table right here. Now, the thing that I want to say about Andrew Collins' book here is it's amazingly well-researched. If you read some of the reviews, I think I mentioned this in part one, if you read some of the reviews of the book at Amazon, there are scholars there who are chiming in and saying this is a doctorate-level work in terms of research and the presentation of ideas. He's really taken a deep look at multiple cultures and ideas throughout history and tried to see if there was a way that they might connect to the temple at GT. And we got this book. We really enjoyed it. It was a primary source for us on this series. And tonight what we're going to do is talk about some of the theories that he's inferred. Connections. Yeah. Connections. Connections. I mean, we're all about, just me personally, of course, that's, you know, a running gag here that everything's connected. But once you see all the things he brings up and the points, and sure, some of it is a, yeah, an educated conjecture, you would say, that um, I would say go beyond guess too, because it's not a haphazard stab in the dark, shot in the dark about, well, maybe this happened. If he says that, if he wonders that, there's an interesting and studied and a documented kind of connection that he found in history that may provide some connections to these puzzle pieces that we're looking at. That's right. And when you start looking at it, it's like, you may not buy it, you may not jump into it, but it's like, you got to give them credit. Like, that's a really interesting connection that maybe there is something there. Yeah. And even if you don't agree with every theory or idea that he puts forth, it does open your mind to the ideas that might be possible. And also it might get you thinking even in a different direction about something you hadn't considered before. And that's what I, I really enjoyed about his book. We'll have a link to the book with our show notes and of course in our bookstore, which We update infrequently, but we do update uh, if you want to purchase it directly through us. Amazon usually will send us as much as two or three cents for each book sold. (laughs) So buy Uh, (laughs) several million of them. No, we already have, uh, yes, uh, the episode page for uh, part one and part two already have a link to that book. Oh, okay, uh, great. On there. So you you click on that, that takes you right to Amazon. I think for part two, you know, there's different papers, a PDF for uh, Schmidt and his paper that he wrote about the conclusions at the time regarding... Um, Klaus Schmidt's paper. Yes, yes. exactly, Klaus Schmidt's We're going to be adding paper. another paper to that tonight, right. too. As far as this book, I don't think that there's any other comprehensive and as thoroughly researched, you know, some are calling it a masterwork on this subject because it is so exhaustive, but without being uh, exhausting, in that it's all these connections throughout the ages and different cultures of the time and various theories that he's come across. And uh, sometimes you see books that are kind of on this and in these subjects, and the author, well-meaning, I think, is making some huge leaps that you might go along with out of just it being fun, and it's like, okay, that's fun to entertain. 
But here, it's really, the guy's done his homework, let's say, just yes. to generally nail this down. It's a tremendous amount of uh, research and uh, connections to other researchers. And one last thing I want to say about the book is that it references Klaus Schmidt very heavily throughout. and Reverently. And he interviewed him before he passed away. So, yeah, they definitely you know, so. met up for this project, not his book so much, but at the site while he was alive. And Andrew Collins has a lot of respect for the work that Schmidt had done and follows his line a lot, basically uses him as a guide in which to bounce these other ideas off of and maybe expand with them and, and maybe run with them a little bit. But definitely there's a lot of reverence there and he doesn't put anything out unless, I would say, unless Schmidt was kind of in line with it, or if it isn't, He'll just take that idea a little further than Schmidt did. And he's not argumentative or dismissive of anybody. And I would suggest that he isn't of critics of his work either. He just put it out. It is what it is. He took as scientific of an approach as he could to providing speculative information. But he's just saying, hey, look, you know, these are all these connections you might make. Yeah. So we're looking forward to talking more about this book this evening. One of the areas I want to start with is the symbolism that you find on the temples. There's actually a lot of H glyphs on the monuments. They look like the letter H. Now, remember, we're predating writing by thousands of years, so they're not the letter H. They have to be something else. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's for all intents and purposes. For our age, it is the letter H as brought to you by whomever. But the uh, <laughs> as but brought yeah, to you by yeah, it's not even uh, the, the hunter gatherers. <laughs> it's H for hunter gatherer. <laughs> it, it, it could be. It's clearly a Helvetica uppercase letter H that we mentioned in part two is being uh, found inscribed in low relief on these pillars, these rectangular pillars. And we didn't really get into it because now is the time to get into what they could possibly mean. Yeah. So one of the things that Colin says in his book is that he thought that they might represent the idea of a portal or a connection between two worlds, possibly across space and time. So if you think of like an hourglass and the narrow passage where the sand moves from one reservoir to the next, and if you turn an hourglass on its side, that's the infinity symbol, interestingly. Yeah. But it is also kind of an H shape if you take it to its extreme. And these portals may be a central idea to Gobekli Tepe, which is something that will become more clear as we talk about it further. Yeah, I think a good way to picture it in your mind, because of course you're listening to this, is uh, picture the letter H. And then think about what we told you about the two pillars that are in the center, the most important pieces and, and focal points of these enclosures, as being two rectangles. And when you look at the letter H, that's what you have. You have two vertical rectangles. And with the letter H, you have a crossbar that connects these two upright pillar rectangles. And in Gobekli Tepe, you had the two pillars, but you did not have a connecting member on them, except in the designs that were found on the slabs themselves. Yeah, so if you picture that, what the idea here is, one pillar is one world, our world of the physical earth. The other pillar is the heavens, the spiritual realm, where we are born from and where we go to die. And that cross member in the H is the connection between those. Again, that's a classic symbol found here from the beginning of <laughs> civilization to today, where you cross between two upright pillars or standing monoliths in between them. And so with this H also, you see it in the carvings on its side. So imagine an H turned 90 degrees now on its side, possibly also symbolizing a heaven and an earth plane, more simply, like where you have a flat part of the H and a connecting rod in between them to get to the heavens, the skies. Yeah, and that will come up as you look at how Collins interprets a lot of the stuff going on at GT, specifically the idea of an axis mundi, or a pole that the planet rotates around, and then the idea of a sky pole, which is like a, in a circus tent that holds up the sky. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the difference between the earth that you live on, and here's the sky, and here's this pole that holds it up, and this ongoing theme that the hole in the roof of a tent, or there might be a tent where you would take psychotropic substances, or you would have a fire inside, and the smoke going up through the hole outside represents moving on to the next plane. Exactly. It's all symbolic. Yeah, imagine, like what Scott said, imagine... As they would have pictured it, these primitive hunter-gatherers, 
the night sky, imagine back then too, just must have been brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> no light pollution at all. Zero light pollution. Zero light pollution. Unless the entire planet's on fire, which we're going <laughs> well, to talk about. Well, uh, maybe that might have been quite a sight itself or a possible <laughs> aurora borealis gone haywire. But imagine True. that the night sky is a canopy of stars because in their world, uh, especially these folks didn't have a lot of permanent structures because they're moving to hunt game. So it's like a hunting lodge that you you set up and you, you kind of leave that for a while. You're following the game. You might come back to it in a little while, chasing the game back to where they were or in another season. But to them, it's like a teepee or a structure that you put up. And so to their mind, the North Star, the Pole Star, which everything else rotates around is what's holding up the sky, an imaginary giant pole. So that idea, imagine that, is that there's a, a shaft that goes all the way through the center of the Earth and right up into the heavens. And by the way, the North Star is our pole star. Believe it or not, those shift. And we're going to talk about that too, how back then a different star was the pole star. Before we get on to that, I do want to talk about this other glyph. This really blew me away because, again, this is in Colin's book. It's pretty fascinating. And what this is, is it looks like two C shapes, closer to kind of a horseshoe, almost U shape or a C. It's not quite as long as a U, more C-like. And they're arranged vertically. So imagine a horseshoe with like the open end pointed down, and then there's a horizontal bar type shape under it. And then under that, another horseshoe with the open end pointed up. Now, this is complete speculation, which Collins admits whenever he's talking about any of this stuff, but he suggested that this might be a bird's eye view, a direct overhead view, or in this day and age, a drone view, uh, <laughs> <You're right. Yeah. laughs> that, that symbolizes two people sitting down to confer or meet or maybe do something ceremonial, and the bar in the middle is a type of table of sorts, maybe an earthen table or represents some kind of barrier like just a mound or something that comes out of the dirt. So the question would be, is that what this symbol represents? You know, like who would those two people be and what would they be doing? This is the thing that is super amazing about this particular symbol. Aboriginal Australian medicine men have the exact same symbol painted on their chest. There's a picture of one in the book, and that's exactly what it represents to them. So this begs the question, how did this symbol get from this site buried for thousands of years in what is currently Turkey and only recently uncovered to show the symbol, how did it get from there onto an Aboriginal shaman in Australia? Well, what's interesting is that, by the way, he doesn't say they're definitely connected. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but he doesn't say that. He's not implying that at all, but I'm saying they got to be connected. I mean, it's the same exact <laughs> it's the, symbol. It's the same symbol. No, he it's came the across it. Exactly. The imagery is the same. The graphic design, if you will, is the same as what's found on one of the belts that we mentioned in part two that are on these large rectangular monolith slabs. It's representative of a belt, but that design is on there. And, yeah. and, oh, and so to, to elaborate how the uh, Aboriginal peoples of Australia see that symbol is that they view it as, imagine two people sitting down, maybe your, your legs are out in front of you and your arms are open, maybe extended to the other person. When you look straight down at that, it forms a C shape. If you're looking straight down at it, like imagine, yes. yeah, your body, your chest and your arms straight out in front of you, that forms a C. That's what that is meant to represent to them. And... Possibly the connection translates to the people from Gobekli Tepe, and that to them, the same kind of gesture looking at it that way. But there's another thing I want to say about as far as uh, how different cultures will interpret visual cues from nature. I studied a little bit about the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, and what I love about them is that they have a really, it's a very spiritually uh, complex and interesting and dense view of the you know, of our physical world tied to the spiritual world. You wonder, are they seeing things the same way as maybe these people of the Anatolian plain did 10,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago? Is there a human connection that we all recognize other than the, the real, uh, if you paint a bowl, like, you know, and you have horns on it and legs, most people are going to kind of pick up on that. You don't have to label it. But these more abstract ideas of things that are spiritual or supernatural, when we try and put those into symbols, is that some kind of a universal language that we can all pick up? And that is kind of one of the discussions tonight. Are these translations or these interpretations of these symbols going to stand up to our modern eye as these ancient people saw them? 
I would like to know what that symbol means and, and what these other glyphs mean. And there's more to think about here. And again, Collins goes into great detail on this. And if you want to read more about this, we highly suggest you picking up his book. We're only covering very, very minute parts of it. There is just a ton of info in there. I actually feel like I'm going to need to read it a few times. <laughs> it to, is one uh, of those, yeah. Take it all in. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. But the other thing that he talks about is that the enclosures are designed only to be viewed as you walk clockwise around the outside. If you walk counterclockwise, I guess you don't see the faces. So I thought that was interesting. There's an implication there. Every little thing means something. There's a reason behind it. So you you have to start looking at that. And, and again, 12,000 years ago, there's no way we're ever going to find out what it meant unless somebody actually invented writing thousands of years before it was invented and then wrote all this down in a stone and then hid that stone somewhere and somehow we find it intact and it explains <laughs> right. exactly. Well, yeah. And it's the instruction manual for the temple at Gobekli Tepe. Right, but think of it this way, just uh, logically, when you have this massive of an undertaking I don't care if you have writing or not. People, I believe, you know, they're not any dumber back then. They might be ignorant of certain things, but these people who put this together were pretty smart for their time. And you don't go ahead with this massive undertaking that's going to take 500. Now there's, uh, I think, maybe uh, almost 1,000 people to do this. Yeah, at any given time. Yeah, over time to put this together. If someone doesn't have a good plan, (laughs) it's like, you know, if this isn't well thought out, you're not going to get people on your side to to do this. And so kind of what Scott's saying is that as these are arranged, and another thing I noticed, the pattern that comes up that is mentioned is that the entrances to these are usually from the south. So you enter from the south into the enclosure, heading north, and you would walk in, and uh, one of the enclosures has another circle enclosure within it. So you're meant to walk through this, they think, in a certain way, which is clockwise. And here's an interesting point. That is a pattern clockwise. Of course, they didn't have clocks back then, but think about this. It's also natural. It's a natural movement in that the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And if you look at it a certain way going around, that's the way the sun moves, depending on how you're looking at the earth clockwise. Right. The sun does not approach into the northern sky. It rises in the east to them and where they're at on the earth in the northern hemisphere, stays more to the southern sky and dips down into the west. And so they're taking these cues from nature, from their natural world, to imbue into their sacred ceremonies. And so that's the idea, is that if you did it the other way, you wouldn't see any of these images on these animals. Why spend the time carving them if no one's going to see them on the other side? So you proceed around the circle and are greeted by the carvings of these uh, animals and insects, and it's supposed to have some kind of meaning. And in between are benches, so maybe people were seated, uh, maybe shaman or other religious participants were seated on these stone benches while certain initiates would proceed through this. And uh, you see it in common ceremonies today. In religious ceremonies or things like Masonic ceremonies, there's a procedure and they all mean something. So that's kind of the pattern. the direction you travel in. What corner of the room do you go to first? Exactly. Who sits at specific points? All of those things could theoretically be traced back to the ideas that are at the root of this, the first temple. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at the two T-pillars that are in Enclosure D, the largest of all the pillars uncovered, they might symbolize twins. They are twin pillars. They are shaped and treated like twins, although they don't have identical carvings on them. They are technically in the same position relative to the rest of the enclosure. The history of multiple cultures shows that a lot of these ancient cultures considered the placenta at birth as the place of the soul and the twin of the person that's born. So in a lot of cases, the placenta would be treated with reverence and often ceremonially buried after birth or kept in a sacred place. This burial would often be, in Japanese culture, for example, buried under a large tree that might be known as the Tree of Life. This tree, again, being a representation of a sky pole, which is connected to the idea of Axis Mundi, which is the invisible axis that points to the pole star, and the night sky rotates around it, like we were just talking about. So there's that one possibility. These T-pillars may also represent more than just twins. They may represent actual specific gods or the idea of them. Moving on to the next thing that seems to be really significant about Gebekli Tepe, there is the idea of the Great Rift. Right. 
You know, the Great Courses Plus has come in so handy for us with this series, but the big picture that's starting to form with me is that great cultures get built up for centuries and then almost wiped out completely. It's just like the Matrix. For example, like what we're learning in our latest course, The Barbarian Empires of the Steppes. Genghis Khan's grandson, Hulagu, nearly destroyed all of Baghdad, which was a center of Islamic knowledge, art, and architecture. It's said the Tigris ran black with ink from the thousands of texts that were thrown in. Then it ran red with blood from the tens of thousands that were massacred. Well, if you're a great conqueror from the steppes, you gotta live up to your name. Like Attila the Hun was known as the Scourge of God, and Tamerlane's nickname was the Prince of Destruction. But if you step back, pun intended, and look at the whole through line of nomads to sedentary civilizations, there are cultural connections because modern-day Turks and Hungarians both lay claim to Attila of the Hun. So we're talking about nomadic barbarians conquering and influencing the cultures that were spawned from the same regions that gave rise to places like Gobekli Tepe. Well, I will say the Great Courses Plus has really opened my eyes to the whole of human history and where we fit in. But the Great Courses Plus is not just about history, folks. Check out a couple of their latest titles, Dog Training 101 and Delicious Dishes for Every Taste. It really is a whole world of learning about everything. And now they've made that learning an even better deal with this terrific limited time offer. Not only can you get your first month free, now you can get your second month for only 99 cents. That's two full months of unlimited access to their entire massive library for under a dollar. But to get this exclusive offer, you must sign up within the next few weeks using our special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Right. So remember to get this special offer of your first month free with your second month for only 99 cents, which is only available for a limited time, you need to sign up right away at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. One last time, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. This is Elizabeth Clark. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. The next thing I want to talk about is the idea that, as Forrest was talking about light pollution, you can imagine that there was probably not too much light pollution to worry about back in uh, 11,500 BC. And if you're fortunate enough to live somewhere remote where there is no light pollution, you might be able to see the Milky Way galaxy on a clear night. Now, if you've ever seen this, then you know that there's actually this dark void right in the middle of it that is known as the Great Rift. The Great Rift is not dark because there aren't stars there. It's dark because of stellar dust. This is actually the place where stars are made. So during the time of Gebekli Tepe, you can imagine that the night sky was a prominent part of early humanity's life. Ancient cultures focused on the Great Rift, of course, and even saw it as a variety of things. The jaws of a Cayman crocodile, as found in Mayan culture, for example, or the pathway to the birth canal. So you can see it was thought of both as a place that could give life or take it away. Was it possible the builders of GT saw the Great Rift as the final destination for the soul upon death? And more specifically, could that destination have been the star Deneb? I'm going to explain why here in a second, but I I want to read this passage from Wikipedia about Deneb. Deneb, also designated as Cygni, is the brightest star in the constellation of Cygnus. It is one of the vertices of the asterism known as the Summer Triangle and forms the head, in quotes, of the necklace Northern Cross, also depicted as a swan, Cygnus, with wings outstretched. It is the 19th brightest star in the night sky with an apparent magnitude of 1.25, a blue-white supergiant. Deneb is also one of the most luminous stars. However, its exact distance, and hence luminosity, has been difficult to calculate. It is estimated to be somewhere between 55,000 and 196,000 times as luminous as the sun, rivaling Rigel as the most inherently luminous star of first magnitude. Here's an important additional quote. Due to the Earth's axial precession, Deneb will be an approximate pole star seven degrees off of the North Celestial Pole at around 9800 AD. So here's what's interesting about that. It won't be the first time that it was a pole star. And that's the whole idea behind axial precession, which is the wobble of the Earth, which has a pattern to it. So the important fact here is 
prior to the year 9500 BC, Deneb never set. It never went below the horizon. So the question is, do the glyphs at Gebekli Tepe indicate a possible warship of Deneb? The research adds up and points to this likelihood. If the people who built GT saw Deneb as the origin of life and the final destination of souls after death, the crazy thing is they were more right than they could know because Cygnus and Deneb specifically are right at the edge of the Great Rift. And as I said a few minutes ago, the rift is dark because of stellar dust because it is a place in the Milky Way galaxy where stars are born. More specifically, the Great Rift, sometimes called the Dark Rift, or less commonly the Dark River, is a series of overlapping non-luminous molecular dust clouds that are located between the solar system and the Sagittarius arm of the Milky Way galaxy at a distance of about 800 to 1,000 parsecs, or about 2,600 to 3,300 light years from Earth. The clouds are estimated to contain about 1 million solar masses of plasma and dust. Starting at the constellation of Cygnus, where it is known as the Cygnus Rift, or Northern Coal Sack, the Great Rift stretches to Aquila, to Ophiuchus, where it broadens out, to Sagittarius, where it obscures the galactic center, and finally to Centaurus. So how do we know that Deneb was significant in Gebekli Tepe's construction? Well, a sighting stone was discovered in Enclosure D, not very far from the twins we were referring to. This stone has a hole in it. I mean, this is classic Indiana Jones stuff right here. This has a <laughs> hole in it that if you'd have looked through it in 9500 BC, you would have been looking dead at Deneb. That was actually calculated by an expert who went and took measurements and then calculated how the night sky would have been positioned back then. These holes in these stones are actually called soul holes. And it's quite likely, based on examples from other descending cultures, that the builders of Gebekli Tepe saw these holes as a way the soul passes from this world to the next. And this hole, as we said, lines up with Deneb. It may have been, for them, their access to the sky world. Another thing that Collins said in his book is that it is believed that the Olmec, a mysterious lost race of people from Mexico, thought that the sun god would be reborn from the Great Rift. Now, again, technically, the Great Rift is the birthplace of stars. How could they possibly know that? And by the way, the Olmec preceded the Maya. So the Maya may have adopted many things from them. He goes on to point out that multiple Native American tribes have ideas about the Great Rift as well, being an opening to the spirit world. And this can even be traced back to the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex, which, as he said, thrived in North America from A.D. 1200 to 1650. So there's connections worldwide here that focus on that part of the sky, which is amazing. Exactly. You just hit on a, on a really good point, which is a theme that the entire book makes a really interesting journey towards. And that is there may have been more, I would say communication, there may have been more connection between these ancient cultures than we think of now, or we're willing to give credit for to these ancient peoples. But there may have been much more a connection as far as ideas and transference of these customs and religious practices, perhaps, or just general ideas about uh, the universe and the technologies they had at the time, even primitive as they were, we don't know yet. And when you talk about the Olmec, uh, I believe this is from another uh, one of the other courses I took on uh, Mesoamerica and uh, archaeology that we had talked about, actually, uh, from the great courses. The Olmec at the time, during this mid-century archaeology that was happening, they thought the Olmec were contemporaries of the Maya. And I believe that they were much older, but his theory wasn't given much credit until some massive stone heads were unearthed on a farmer's land, and yeah, the, we've all seen pictures of those, the photos the of those giant, Olmec heads. Well, well, they're unbelievable. <laughs> they're giant heads. And they're I, so cool. They're so cool. And I, once you start dating the things that are found at those levels, it turns out the Olmec were much older than everyone thought and preceded the Maya, culturally at least, or in that timeline. And so the in other In addition guys, to that, here's the yeah. other fascinating thing about that. 
they have what you would describe today as African-American features. Exactly. I was just about to yeah. say that because... Oh, sorry. I stole your thunder there. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I... But that was another interesting feature is that then you start wondering, like, could ancient African mariners and explorers from the continent of Africa made their way all the way over to South America? It would seem that way. It's totally possible, again. And so you have to rethink these. But my point about archaeology in that... You have these real staunch opinions and uh, by some of the leading people in a line of thinking, and everything else kind of gets shoved aside. Like, no, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Until some evidence comes up that proves them wrong, and I believe I should have probably looked up this story better, but it doesn't really have direct connections to this other than you know going to further the story about possible global connections between these ancient cultures. The person who was wrong is like kind of shrinks into the background now because yeah. you came out and were so convinced, you're so sure of yourself with a lot of hubris and a little bit of arrogance, and then you were proven wrong because like, well, no, you didn't dig further. You're basing it off your preconceived notions, or at least stuff that you found already. And it's a strong argument, but you're not- That's totally why I'm wrong. already backing away from the Japanese capture hypotheses with Earhart and uh, <laughs> leaning towards Bill Snavely's discovery of the plane. Well, I'm doubling down. <laughs> <laughs> you're doubling just, down on uh, Japanese capture. Well, just, no, what's fun about this is that- I mean, you know, it's every topic we do. There's yeah. people in these camps. Here's my thing is that I try to include everything. I try to have an air of inclusiveness at least with my own thinking about this, it's like, well, let's consider it. Some things are strong, some things aren't. Again, when you start talking about like the pole star, basically the tent pole that holds up the universe or the canopy of stars that runs through the earth and is the center of everything, and uh, you start making these connections to Deneb, there's other connections that can be made. Deneb is also known as the Northern Cross. It's the brightest star in that Northern Cross, there's also a connection that can be made to Oak Island and the Swan and Cygnus and the pattern of stones oh, that were found yeah. there. When yeah. you start looking at humans and ha what they place meaning in is that are we so different? Again, like the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, they're doing an opposite. They're looking at the dark spaces. Again, if that's right, I, I apologize <laughs> if I remember that incorrectly, but they're looking at the dark spaces between the stars for their patterns. But there are some similarities. If there's no connection, they came up with the upside down C with the line and then the right side up C or vice versa, independently of these other folks at Gebekli Tepe. And who knows what epic that came from, but there are some similar thematic connections. Yeah, so people, if, they, if you didn't know, at one point, Deneb was the pole star, and that changes due to the effects of precession, which is because right. the earth wobbles. And it, that approximately takes about 26,000 years, according to the book here, that uh, the pole star will, will change. Currently, Polaris is our pole star, part of uh, Ursa Minor. So the time periods are so long that uh, the pole star has changed since the time of uh, GT. And in the time of the Great Pyramids, Thuban, which is a minor star in the constellation of Draco, was the pole star during the age of the pyramids. In the book here, he makes an, an important point about interpretation. There's a German scholar, Dr. Michael Rappengluck of the University of Munich, doing an interpretation, a painting that was found in a pit at Lascaux in southern France, which was around 16,500 to about 15,000 BC. If you look at the images, there looks like to be a bison. Perhaps it's been gored. There is a spear nearby. There is a man in a falling backwards kind of strangely, but you could tell it's a man near the buffalo, under him, there looks to be a bird on a stick. And you wonder like, well, okay, well, this is kind of random. Maybe that was a weird party that happened and got broken up by a raging uh, buffalo that got gored and uh, its entrails are hanging out now. But when you start to interpret it, it's like, well, the guy, but one idea that's throughout the book that it's trying to make is that there are connections here that seem to be genuine and obvious, or at least worth thinking about, who's falling backwards, possibly could be a shaman because he's in a state of arousal, which sometimes happens with hallucinogenic... Psychotropic. Psychotropic, or, yeah. Yeah, psychotropic drugs in a ceremony. And he's maybe having an epiphany or he's in a state of uh, communing with the spiritual world. And the bird on the stick may reference, you know, the celestial pole in that it's Cygnus. So... Dr. Rappengluck had a really interesting theory in that this might be a representation of the constellations. 
in the sky at that time, 16,500 years to about 15,000 BC. That's what would have been uh, their pole star. So you're not seeing a, a painting of stars as they would have seen them. You're seeing an interpretive painting of possibly the constellations as they saw them, which had spiritual meaning to them. Right. We don't know. There's no, there's no caption painted underneath in, the, in a primitive language because they didn't have that then. What they had were images. And so that's what we're left with. But it's a really fascinating interpretation. But it all kind of ties in that uh, that's in southern France. We're talking about southern uh, Turkey, Anatolia. But perhaps these ideas transferred about uh, cosmic configurations having meaning to the birth of everything, the death of everything, and us humans in the middle. Yeah, and not really understanding how the sky works. I'm traveling right now, so I'm recording from somewhere else. I'm looking out the window right now. The sun is just set where I am, and Venus is out here. Only oh, thing right. I can see. Yeah. Super bright. I'm looking right at it, and it looks amazing. There are no other stars in the sky yet, because the sun is uh, its still dusk. But to think about how this all works at that early stage, and why is this star there by itself right now? How come I can see that? Because they couldn't have known that that was a planet necessarily. So maybe some races figured that out, yes, but others may have just thought, not been able to tell the difference between a planet and a star. Anything that shines light is a star of some kind. And, and what is a star? Is it a hole in the sky? Is it something, is it a, a light source affixed to some kind of huge canvas? There's no way to really understand. Right. But the thing that they know is what you think about for them, what they thought about the Great Rift, what we can determine is that we had multiple other cultures worshiping it. And the night sky, I mean, when it got dark, you didn't go inside and turn on the radio. You didn't go inside and watch <laughs> right, TV. Yeah. You didn't sit down and stare at your iPhone and try to see what the latest thing somebody posted on Instagram is. You had pretty much nothing to look at. It's dark. You know what yeah. you get to look at? The sky. <laughs> well, it's like well, a it's lot. like camping. If you've ever been camping and you're not one of those people that brings a flat screen uh, powered by a generator to the campsite, you're doing the communal thing. You're having fun with your family and friends, sitting around the campfire, telling stories, looking up at the night sky, and uh, that's every day for you. And so yeah. what we do know is that they did keep track of the movements of these stars and planets. Yes. The people that were interested in it at the time kept track of this. And over, you know, it could be centuries, patterns were noticed. Oh, one connection I want to make is that as far as the patterns, and we could talk about, you know, certainly there's Scorpio and different uh, constellations in the sky, which had not been invented yet. Yeah, this was thousands of years before the Zodiac. Right, before the Zodiac symbols. Yeah. But talking about the Scorpion images found at the base of one of these flat pillars at uh, Gobekli Tepe, along with some other imagery, but also in Mayan art, there's often a scorpion at the base of the tree of life. Yes. And so making the point that there are some correlations and parallels between disparate cultures thousands of miles away and at different times, that uh, these animals are the same and they do the same things to you and they may have the same meaning, but also making a connection to a similar spiritual meaning as far as like the tree of life or this pillar being representative of a twin of cosmic or spiritual birth or death. So these are big ideas for the people at the time using some of the same imagery and elements. But why don't you make the leap from uh, the Neolithic times to modern times here as far as a rectangular slab is concerned? Of Well, of, it's <laughs> interesting, and I can't take credit for this. I read this online somewhere last year, and I was trying desperately to figure out where it's sourced from, so I can't cite it properly. But it was a, it was an analytical article, and of course there's a billion, there's a subreddit devoted to this, all this stuff. What's the meaning behind 2001, Stanley Kubrick's movie? And we mentioned a little bit about this in part two uh, of our GT series, but the idea is... The monolith, in a way, could that have represented the future? Is it the iPhone? We're all staring at the iPhone. The iPhone <laughs> right. is our mono, our smartphone, not just an iPhone. I won't, don't want to give them the monopoly on that, even yeah. though they mostly have one. But humanity, as we said, has stared transfixed at television for decades. Then they moved to smartphones and the internet. People can't stop looking at them. They're sitting through green lights, ignoring each other at dinner and obsessing over the actions of strangers with it, as I said a few minutes ago. So what did people have for that at the time of the Gobekli Tepe builders, they had the night sky. And you'd have to admit, even today, it is absolutely transfixing. If you can get away from the cities of the world and see it clearly, that's what they saw every night. They spent their lives outside. The night sky was as familiar to them as the face of a loved one and filled with unimaginable mystery. 
What were the stars? They had no knowledge of what they were. Could they even conceive of the concept of space? They're bound to the Earth itself, unable to gain any sort of altitude at all other than by natural geography and maybe eventually structures. How do they get closer to the sky? Hills, mounds, maybe even pyramids, right? It was the only way. If they made it tall enough, do you think they thought they might find a ceiling of some kind? We can never know. But what I think we can be fairly certain of is that the night sky was as much a part of their lives as air, food, and water. And today, I'd say even our smartphones. It was a constant they could rely on. But what about its mysteries? It had them for sure. And the question is, what did they think of them? So going back to Enclosure D at Quebecli Tupa and the sighting stone that was focused on Deneb, which is part of the constellation Cygnus, you look at this and you think, that's the swan. Cygnus is the swan. And I love, for us that you brought up Oak Island because Cygnus ties greatly into a lot of the theories about the stones that have been found on Oak Island. It goes way further than that, which begs the question, is there some thin, tenuous, mini millennia connection between Oak Island and Gebekli Tepe or the cultural reasons behind this obsession with Cygnus and the Great Rift and the source of all life, the source of stars, you know, possibly the source of many of the stars in our galaxy. We can't say the universe because it, the Great Rift is part of the Milky Way. But, you know, you look at this and everyone thinks of Cygnus as the swan, but according to Andrew Collins, there is evidence that in the Euphrates Valley, Cygnus may not have been seen as a swan, but as a vulture. You know what? I'm leaving the show. Okay, great. Wait, wait, what? I'm starting my own podcast. It's called The Astounding Tales Podcast. <sighs> this partnership thing is for the birds. <laughs> uh, all right, what's it about? Well, it's kind of like our show, but without you. Uh, yeah, well, firstly, that's a horrible idea. No one will listen. And secondly, good luck in that domain. Guess what, Chuckles? I went on Squarespace, and it's totally available. Check it out. Astoundingtales.fun. <laughs> wait a second. Dot fun? Oh, you know what? All right. Well, that does sound pretty good. You know what? You can buy your own domain right through Squarespace, and .fun is just one of over 200 extensions available these days. We know a lot of our listeners would like to start podcasts of their own or have other great ideas for online businesses because we get a lot of emails about it, and frankly, we just want to say now is the time. We know you guys are so talented and creative out there because we see your work on our social media. Do what we did and take this opportunity to become your own boss by starting out with your own website on Squarespace. Yeah, Scott's right. You know, Squarespace is already home to architects, art galleries, fine artists, graphic designers, writers, consultants, and many more. It only took us a few hours to get our site set up and running, and we were able to choose from their vast array of beautiful templates, all of which were created by world-class designers. There's powerful e-commerce functionality, too. Built-in search engine optimization so people can find you easily, and free and secure hosting with no patches or upgrades required ever. And their award-winning customer support is available 24-7. So what are you waiting for? Check out squarespace.com legends for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer code LEGENDS to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash legends and use the offer code legends. Whatever you make, make it beautiful, make it stand out, and make it yourself with Squarespace. Hi, I'm an unknowable entity from beyond the pale. Rest assured, you're still listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. And now, back to the show. Okay, so getting to the big picture here, let's talk about the cult of the vulture. Let's recap a little bit. At the Gebekli Tepe enclosure, we have what seems to be an alignment with the Great Rift. We have this sighting stone that when you look through it at the time it would have been built, you would have seen the star Deneb, which is part of the constellation Cygnus, which although thought of as a swan today, may have originally been thought of as a vulture. Vulture is a part of death. Now, Collins points out, and this is, I can't ever name, you're so much better at this, Forrest. Uh, mm. Chetulyahook? <laughs> I can't do it. Chetulyahook? Chetulyahook. There you go. Chetulyahook. I'm just going to let you say it. That place figures prominently because excavations were done there as well, as we've told you in part one and two. And it's a there settlement, survi- not a temple. Yeah, this that was, settlement. exactly. So that was lived in. That was an actual settlement where people lived, and there's some surviving uh, paintings that they had. 
and a lot of them feature images of vultures. Now, an interesting thing is if you're looking celestially at Deneb and the Northern Cross, what appears to be a bird, it's like, well, whether it's a swan or a vulture, the imagery of bird comes across to different peoples of different times and that uh, that's to them what it looked like. But that star figures prominently. But if you look at it as a vulture rather than a swan, well, then just what the two different birds, what they do in life gives it a greatly different meaning. And so as we talked about before, there was a lot of cups that had been uh, scooped out of the stone on uh, high places or around circular uh, openings. At Quebecli Tepe. These cups, if you put chunks of meat in them, what's happening now is you're drawing vultures and carrion birds, birds like hawks who are attracted to dead meat, and uh, usually the vultures get there first, and there, there's kind of a pecking order there of other birds and uh, creatures that come to feast on that. Well, birds throughout have been used for divination purposes. We learned a little bit about that from the Celts, that they uh, observed the movement of birds, and also the ancient Etruscans and the Romans. Cultures throughout history have looked to birds and their patterns and movements and what they do as good or bad omens. Like if you put the meat out there and no birds came, it might be a bad omen. If you put the meat out there and suddenly uh, it's a whole flock of birds and they move in a way that's uh, pleasing according to the rules you got set up, that's a good omen. And also it's kind of, you know, at your shrine there, it's kind of an interactive display. You've now got birds surrounded. Uh, this is just here in L.A. Sometimes there'll be a murder of crows or like a hundred ravens lined up on a line. It's interesting to see. It gets your attention. What they're thinking is that these ancient peoples, what they can piece together from these paintings is that the vulture is some kind of a conduit from our mortal selves, the flesh and bone, that they eat and deflush the skeletons, and somehow the body is transported to another realm, and then that's the function of the vulture. And at, you name the settlement again? Oh, Chitalhuyuk. At that place that Forrest just said, there's a panel <laughs> that shows vultures, and Collins talks about this in his book. This is dated to somewhere between 7,500 and 5,700 BC, which is about 2,000 to 4,000 years after the earliest GT enclosure. Now, on this panel, at the top of one of the towers, there's a headless body in matchstick form. It's actually upside down. Colin says this is because the head is considered the seat of the soul. And when the head is removed, the body is nothing more than that, just a body. The panel shows these two towers. And although it's not clear to me if they're two different towers or one that was used two different ways, but it shows that the matchstick man body at the top of one, as the vultures come to presumably feast on it, and clean the bones. Then again, it shows just a head at the top. Same thing with the vultures. Collins points out this type of death is more rare today, but some remote Tibetan Buddhists still practice a form of this kind of ritual, and it's known as a sky burial. So coming back to the big picture, and remember, this is all conjecture, but it fits together surprisingly well. Gobekli Tepe could be a place of worship and offerings to the star Deneb in the Cygnus constellation at the very edge of the Great Rift, a place where they may have thought all life emanated from. Now, while it may have been a place for sacrificial rites also, or even birthing rituals, it does not appear to have been a part of burial rituals, although those may have taken place close by at Chitulhuyuk. But you can tie it all together. The vultures are the soul carriers, according to Collins, the head being the seat of the soul. They take that soul away to the sky and to the other world. So coming back to the sky pole and the stars and the night and these animals, these creatures that can fly, that must seem magical to them because this is the one animal that can be on their earth bound by the ground, but it can also fly up into the sky, a place that they can never get to, at least not physically. So if you believe any of this at all, then what you're looking at here is the same thing that has always fascinated man. It's where do we go after we die and how do we get there? It's the eternal question. Now, the next question about how this all may have worked is at what point do the animals involved in these rituals become humans in costumes or shamans? Pillar 43 at GT, which is considered one of the most important pillars discovered so far, clearly shows a man dressed as a vulture 
holding a ball, a large ball. The wings are outstretched. And the ball is above the wings. It's a round circle, which, you know, at first glance, I thought like, well, that could be the sun. You know, certainly the Egyptians, the scarab rolled the sun across the sky or the full moon. But in this case, it's believed to be a representation of the head. And think about it as a stick man, the round part being the head, also the container for the soul that this bird is holding and guiding, perhaps. But it's not really a giant bird, or maybe even a half-man, half-bird kind of deity. It may represent a shaman dressed as a bird. Right. And that's why it has more anthropomorphic features, because it's not some scary mothman, necessarily. (laughs) It's a person wearing a bird costume who is a shaman, as you just said. Or it could be Mothman, I don't know. We, we, don't, we don't know. <laughs> it, it, they may have their own version of that back then, which uh, that certainly would cause them to etch that into stone. But that's what uh, Collins is getting at, is that there's a shamanistic tradition, which he also uh, said that Schmidt's interpretation over the years was that it was a, there was a heavy shamanistic element here going on, ceremonially that it's not aliens or people from uh, another realm, possibly, at least in Schmidt's view, but that certainly there was a a medicine man aspect of this, that these ceremonies were conducted by people who were hierophants, the keepers of knowledge of tradition. But where did they get this tradition? How did it form? And how was it shared? And so, again, there's nothing written down, but with these images that we do have from the stone, you start to see possibly a depiction of what went on there and the greater meaning. And yes, and so vultures being part of uh, the death cults that we examined and uh, basically after the bones have been stripped of flesh that they're now buried and the skulls were either buried in the walls or under the floors. So that's how they view death. That's what they did with it. And that's what they're thinking of. That's where you go. You get carried off by the great vultures into the afterlife. That's really fascinating. And the idea that that is the seat of the soul, which is probably something that a lot of people still believe today. And then this journey that you take in death, where do you go and where do they think that everything comes from and goes to? And maybe they're making all these connections. Again, this is a lot of speculation, but it does kind of work with everything that's been found in a certain way. But, you know, we're reverse engineering philosophy here. Collins is doing it with a great deal of background, and that's what makes it really fascinating to me. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is just this idea of a comet, because this is when we're coming down to the possibility. And again, at the top of the show, we talked about how Professor Klein or Dr. Klein said, these are all the things that Gebekli Tepe is not. And one of the things that he talked about was that it was not connected to necessarily a interstellar catastrophic event. But right, there was no post-last ice age catastrophe that has anything to do with this site as we know it. But what Collins is doing is, again, looking at the picture of why. Why would you go to this effort and what did it mean? And looking at it as such a tremendous effort by groups of people over a long period of time who had no previous interest in getting together to do anything in a group scale, other than in small, you know, family clans, perhaps, and small tribal units to survive, and many hands make light work. That certainly applies in hunting and gathering, but to do something like this, which had no benefit, as we said in in part one, it's not to storehouse grain or to host big parties. This had a... uh, There may have been parties there. (laughs) (laughs) There were feasts, but we know that. Well, the reason for this is got to be bigger than the people themselves, you know what I'm saying? Rather than just somebody's interest of a king that just wanted a monument to himself, there's a reason that's cosmic. And so what Collins is doing is like, okay, now he's piecing this together to form a bigger picture than probably most archaeologists of the processual uh, persuasion would want to go because there's just no evidence to it. But he's trying to piece together a story about what would these people believe? What would motivate them? What kind of event would spark them, put the fear in them, the fear of God or fear of gods in this case, to want to do this? And perhaps it is because of a catastrophe, a really bad time on earth. If something did happen, it may have been hundreds of years before the people at Gebekli Tepe started working on this thing but it was remembered. Let's talk about that. On Pillar 18 in Enclosure D, 
there's this belt buckle, which we mentioned in uh, part one or part two, I'm sh- I know. It's a belt buckle type of glyph on the side or the front of the T if you're thinking of it anthropomorphically. To be clear, when you think of the T, remember it's presented to you as a letter T that faces you, so you can see what defines it. But Gobekli Tepe was built at a time that predated writing. So letters to them weren't T's at all, they were just shapes. And what the T's seem to represent is a stylized version of the human body. The front in this case being what we would normally think of as a side when talking about something shaped like a capital T. So on the front, on pillar eight, in enclosure D, Enclosure D is the one we're going to be talking about the most here because it's the most significant one. On the front is this thing that seems like a belt buckle or an adornment of some kind because it appears below the hands and above a loincloth that seems to be made from a fox pelt. Now, Collins posits that this belt buckle could be modeled on a comet with a tail, and he provides ample evidence of other cultures using this type of imagery to depict comets, including a Chinese atlas from somewhere between 300 and 200 B.C., Now, again, this could all be elite, but what if the belt buckle is a ceremonial representation of a comet? Because when you see a comet coming down and it's got the the plumes coming off of it, especially two or three of them, it is pretty much identical to this symbol. It could be something else, but think about what hunter-gatherers might have thought if they saw a comet and based on their understanding of the sky and how that worked. Or something like the Chelyabinsk meteor that hit Russia in February of 2013, which everybody saw those YouTube videos, which is amazing. Blew out windows for miles around. Oh, think about that happening back then. Yeah, at least they didn't have windows. <laughs> they didn't have windows, <laughs> but they didn't have any scientific explanations either. Imagine what that would have done to their psyche if a chunk of comet broke off or a, a basketball-sized meteorite comes down, knocks everything down, knocks over animals through the shock wave. Your mind would go crazy that the gods are completely angry and uh, something needs to be done. The sky is literally falling. So the design we're talking about is is found on the front. It would be considered kind of like a belt buckle. And what the shape is, it's like a C on its side, 90 degrees, or a U shape. And then within that would be like another U shape. You have the arms of the U or like the horseshoe shape and then another vertical stripe in the middle. So it's like a three-pronged design. And so what Collins is suggesting here is that this may be graphically representational, an icon. If you had an icon for it on your iPhone for a comet, it might be a circular head with this tail coming out. And there are similar images in other ancient writings and pictures glyphs, ideograms of this kind of a a similar pattern. And that's the connection that he's making is that perhaps this event is being remembered in this symbol in shorthand in a way. Speaking of the icons, um, I think it's safe to say that Gobekli Tepe carvings are probably in the public domain, right? At this point. We're going to get sued either way. I think we should (laughs) go ahead and start making our Gobekli Tepe emojis. Oh, there you go. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, you could have that on a coffee cup, certainly the design, because it's just graphically, it's very simple, but whatever it was, it means something. Because if you look at the other interpretations that are going on there, like we talked about, there's a pillar at the top that looks like they have handbags, or as some have called them man bags, and there's a little carving of an animal next to them, because they look like a square with a handle on the top. That may be not so much a bag, but a cage that those animals go into because, again, they were starting to practice animal husbandry and herd animals. Below that are some V-shapes, and that might be a symbol for water, that pattern. And so, again, these aren't haphazard. Some are geometrical shapes that, as we use them today for decoration, but obviously... A lot of these things have meaning, it seems, that they weren't haphazard or just somebody doodling. Because, again, it's the nature of this. Not, this is not graffiti. Most of it isn't. I don't know about the, uh, we're talking about the naked woman in part two. But each thing that you put up there has some meaning. And now they're trying to figure out what that meant to these ancient peoples that could only go by visual things and stories told to them verbally through the generations And maybe it has something to do with a major event, let's say, in their world that made them want to pray that it didn't happen again or to revere it, but certainly to remember it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the question. What if Gobekli Tepe was built by generations who remembered an apocalyptic event like that? And it was built as a kind of warning and a place to appease whatever God or forces led to that kind of destruction. Because here's the thing about it. It actually seems to coincide pretty closely 
with the end of what is known as the Younger Dryas Period. That's a 1,300-year-long sudden onset of a mini ice age. And in fact, there's evidence around the world of a specific charcoal-rich layer of sediment that I think is about eight inches in depth that appears in multiple places at the same level of strata. And that indicates that something like this may very well have happened. This is called the Ucello Horizon. And believe it or not, it dates to just about the right time. But of course, not everybody agrees on that. So the question is, could the Ucello Horizon have been caused by a collision between the Earth and a large extraterrestrial object or collection of objects that upon contact with the atmosphere shattered into millions of pieces, raining down fire and rock on the planet, causing widespread destruction and a nuclear winter? Imagine what the survivors of an incident like that would tell their descendants. What if Gebekli Tepe is part of that message? It just so happens that hard science has, of course, looked into this, and there's opinions about it, which we're going to talk about here shortly. But before we go on to that, I do want to talk a little bit about the idea of the T's, the large pillars, the T's, being known as what Collins calls the hooded ones. Because we could tell from this time period that they knew how to carve a normal human head because we found these heads at Navali Chori. And they've been found at right. other well, sites. They're normal, spherical human heads. Yes, exactly. There's examples of that in various degrees. There's, you know, it's called Urfa Man, which we talked about before, of uh, being a mostly, you know, realistic anthropomorphic man. He's got a regular shaped head, shoulders. Uh, his legs, though, taper down into kind of a post where he would be slotted into a, a stand. But there's a nose, there's a black obsidian eyes. It's obvious that they know what that looks like. There is another case of the skin head, which is a human-looking round head with ears. I believe the face had been chipped off, and the head had been knocked off the original statue, and had been placed in the wall, I think a scolia, like pieces of, of artwork stuffed into something else later on by later peoples, but kept. And what's interesting is that where there would be a ponytail, or it could look like a ponytail on the back of this bald head, is an image of a snake, a carving in low relief of a snake pointing downwards, slithering downwards, but it's obvious it's a snake that looks like a ponytail in this guy. So that you could say is like, well, look, they didn't make all their heads square. That there's a differentiation between us regular humans and what these pillars are supposed to represent, which is maybe ultra human, something possibly supernatural. But there's elements within these T-shaped slabs that it's not just the, the shapes of like the arm, like I said, if, you know, there's bent arms curling around the front, the very narrow edge of these, which is supposed to be the front of the person. There are fingers you can see carved, you know, with a thumb above a belt buckle, below that an image of a pelt. But on top, there also looks to be a cowling, kind of like a sash or some kind of decorative jewelry below the neck, meaning that this person is ceremonially different than the rest of us worshipers or the builders themselves, and that these are the revered beings of this enclosure. That's what we're supposed to pay our attention to. And also it looks like, I believe on one half of the top of the T, that there is some kind of a hood. So these figures have been come to known as the hooded ones. Right. So the idea is like, why are they hooded and why are their heads so long? So there's yeah, a question right. of like, did they have a lot of hair? Did they have elongated skulls? And we've talked about this before in uh, some of our other episodes of Astonishing Legends. If there was trepanning where the skulls are, you know, manipulated in youth to grow that way. But it also could be something more than that. And one of the things that Collins talks about is maybe they are historic representations of a race of, like Forrest was just saying, a possibly mythical status that has long disappeared, but were legendary for some reason or another. Yeah. And he's quick to point this out, which he does repeatedly, but there's really no way for us to know what was going on at GT. We can really only guess at it, but, you know, the guessing's our favorite part. So he, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Speaking you of know. guessing, here's a little fun nugget for you that I just was uh, talking to Scott about earlier off the top of my head. The elongated skulls reminded me of the recent testing done on the Paracas skulls, found in South America. Right. We talked about this during the Giant series, I think, didn't we? Yeah, exactly. A little bit. It was kind of making the alternative news that these skulls, which look like there's a giant Tylenol glued to the top of the head, very long top of the, uh, the skull, all one piece. And so people were saying like, well, that can be done, of course, by cranial manipulation as a child. You can squeeze somebody's head, uh, to eventually grow into that shape. Certainly a Native American tribes like the Flathead tribes would put a, a board attached to a baby. Your head would grow into that shape of a flattened forehead at an angle, 
they have done DNA testing on those skulls, and it is not so much South American, but European and Middle Eastern, the DNA heritage of these skulls. So that's a little weird. Was there something to do with these skulls and some ancient peoples or being seen by ancient peoples and being represented? That's just, yeah, probably not. I'm just throwing that out there. No, but it's interesting. I think one of the things that I had read too was when they look at the joints, the way the parts of the skull come together, it, it seems to be a natural formation as opposed to a manipulated one. Exactly right. You know, once you mature, the way that the bones in your skull fuse together Looking at that, it does not seem to be um, manipulated. And also, no one, as far as I know, has come out and debunked these skulls as not being real. They just think it's uh, anything strange going on, that it's been bound that way. But anyway, it's interesting connections, but that's an obviously weird kind of looking person if you were to see them in real life, especially to people who weren't used to doing that practice. And suddenly you see people that look much different than you. That's what it's kind of getting at here. And this is where Collins is going, is that these hooded figures probably look different than the people that were doing the building. And that influenced them to make these things, to maybe even direct the building of it and to tell them what the importance is that there is an elite, is what he's getting at. There yes. is a shamanistic, perhaps, or cultural elite that are guiding the construction here. All right, so you know we've really been talking a lot about Enclosure D, because that's the one with the biggest T-pillars. It's the one that has the siding stone that's focused on Cygnus, all of that kind of thing. And it seems to be the one that, in a lot of ways, at least right now, is giving us the most information. So the question becomes, for me, is this like some sort of permanent history record? Why did ancient cultures do things in stone? Because it would be there forever. Well, I mean, first of all, they didn't have paper, but also <laughs> right, it's really. going to be there forever. Yeah. How can you leave your mark? You no, know, it's the what... same idea with a stella, the Code of Hammurabi uh, being extra right. stone. Of course, that lasts. We still got a, a couple of copies around. And also it carries into the Middle Ages, like the symbolism that's been carved into the great cathedrals of Europe, because it takes maybe 100 years to build it, but it's going to be around a lot longer after that. And that's what people know, because paper burns, other, <laughs> all your other right. forms of media at the time aren't as permanent as a giant stone structure. I still worry about the hard drives that have our archives on them. Well, so. those are gone. That's like, <laughs> they were never... <laughs> Just waiting for an EMP to take those out. Well, as we're going to talk about, what's interesting is that the early days, the motto was, if it doesn't exist in two different places with a computer it or a computer data. It doesn't exist. It's so ephemeral, it could easily go away. Now, there's an embarrassing shot of you. It's all over the internet forever <laughs> until yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of the internet goes away. And it yeah. can happen. People like to think they're very secure in that, but it could all go away. That's true, it could. Well, they knew that it wouldn't, so then the question becomes, what is GT? Could it be a place that was revered as the location of both the knowledge of how to maintain a sedentary lifestyle instead of being hunting and gathering? Could it also have been a place focused on keeping the sky gods happy so that some cataclysmic event that was an ancient memory but still present in the minds of one of these cultures, because maybe there was more than one culture involved in this, right. and that's what the T's represent. It's, it's really fascinating. So then the next thing, of course, I mean, this is part of the subtitle, of Andrew Collins' book, After Gebekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, the subtitle is The Temple of the Watchers right. and the Discovery of Eden. Well, this is when it gets really far out. Well, we're taking a slow, careful march here towards the edge of the fringe here, which yeah, is yeah. as the more we talk about this, the further out it goes. But I would say it's no less researched by Andrew yeah. Collins because these are all connections to ancient texts and myths and cultural uh, markers that are known. But yeah, you're not going to draw straight lines, but a lot of these things are parallel, certainly, and they do make some really interesting connections. So bear with us as this gets more out there and woo-woo, perhaps. I think it gets even more fascinating. Getting back to the younger Dryas period that we mentioned a while back, that was a mini ice age. The end of it seemed to maybe coincide with about the time that Gebekli Tepe was built. So there's some reason to think, at least by Collins, that there is a connection there. And in looking back, if there was some kind of uh, catastrophic interstellar event where huge rocks rained out of the sky and caused a nuclear winter, think about how that would affect the planet, not only in terms of the weather, the you know blocking out the sun, blocking out light, the plants are going to change, animals that aren't killed instantly, 
their migration habits are going to change. People and animals alike are going to be moving to parts of the planet they haven't been to before. Climate is going to support a different lifestyle at those parts of the planet. And so cultures that don't adapt are going to be wiped out and cultures that do are going to survive. So it's very interesting to think about what something like that might have done to the planet. Now, the Watchers, for those that aren't initiated into understanding about who they are, they're essentially angels. And the idea of the Watchers comes from the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is pretty fascinating. It can be found in the Old Testament, but it dates to 300 B.C., And the Watchers may be thought of as angels, both good and bad. Listen to this uh, description. In the Book of Enoch, the Watchers, and in Aramaic, also called Irian, I-Y-R-I-N, I'm probably not saying that correctly, but they are angels dispatched to earth to watch over the humans. They soon begin to lust for human women, and at the prodding of their leader, Semyaza, defect en masse to illicitly instruct humanity and procreate among them. The offspring of these unions are the Nephilim, savage giants who pillage the earth and endanger humanity. If you listen to all of our episodes, you've heard about them before. Oh, yes. We're connecting everything ourselves here to giants and these uh, creatures that walk the earth. But the idea here is a little different than possibly what most people think about angels in that they're heavenly beings of light with wings floating down. This take on them is that they are much more human-like. They're not human totally, but they are more corporeal, shall we say, physical, more anthropomorphic to regular humans, but still with some amazing powers and knowledge that uh, regular humans do not have. Samyaza and his associates had further, this is from Wikipedia, taught their human charges arts and technology such as weaponry, cosmetics, mirrors, sorcery, and other techniques that would otherwise be discovered gradually over time by humans, not foisted upon them all at once. Eventually, God allows a great flood to rid the earth of the Nephilim, but first sends Uriel to warn Noah so as not to eradicate the human race. The Watchers are bound in the valleys of the earth until Judgment Day. This is pretty fascinating because it talks about how they came down and that the Nephilim are an offspring of them. But what's interesting to me about this is Collins points out that if you look at the Book of Enoch, it makes it pretty clear that the Watchers and the Nephilim actually coexisted, that the Nephilim were already present. So he disagrees that they were the offspring of humans and angels or humans and Watchers. Right. So that's an interesting idea. But the idea of these beings that were superior, bringing all this technology, including you know, the very idea of cosmetics for women and weaponry down to people, that's very interesting. So then you come to this possibility that maybe Gobekli Tepe is a monument to the Watchers. Right. Or the other thing that he posits is that the Watchers and the Nephilim and that buzzword, the Anunnaki, are all the same thing. And for those that haven't heard of the Anunnaki, Forrest, you can probably do this more justice in terms of its reputation than I can, but they represent <laughs> they represent these gods of the sky and the earth that a lot of the ancient aliens people have connected with alien beings. Oh yeah, no, this goes off into uh, way, way, even more woo than this. It's a, a triple woo uh, on the woo-woo. Woo-woo! But uh, Zechariah <laughs> Sitchin, who is a Azerbaijani American author and a researcher, he's done some translations on, I believe, ancient Sumerian texts concerning the Anunnaki, and it gets into possibly being the precursors to human being somewhat alien, or these godlike figures that were responsible for the creation of humans. And if you extrapolate that to not just being mythological, that somehow there is technology involved and maybe these were off-planet beings that were seen as deities. But that's where we come from, is that we are a hybrid created race by these larger beings. Enki and Enlil, basically the, the human portion of that, turned that into mythology, whereas these may have been real beings that... Uh, in, yes, and Enki and Enlil, while not necessarily biologically twins, if they are the Anunnaki, the original Anunnaki, there again is the idea of the two pillars, the T-pillars at Gobekli Tepe. That also figures in uh, twins being prominent here. And it's not just the duality of 
the male and the female or of the binary parts of everything that makes up the universe. But it is more than that. It is kind of seen as a... Um, a mythological duality, I guess. These are the ideas that you have in putting two of something together. And so the idea of the twin, especially at birth, or the fight between two opposing uh, godlike figures that we see here means something. And that has always meant something throughout, you know, human beings' history as far as, you know, in thinking about mythology. It's something that can be seen as a two-parter, but how do they figure? Well, here's an explanation that the Anunnaki kind of fills that may be an explanation and create a through line down to these ancient peoples and even into ancient Sumeria with these same kind of ideas about the watchers. I mean, look at Greek and Roman mythology. Giving humans knowledge that they're not supposed to have has great consequence even amongst the gods themselves in that they are often banished for this. So, you know, these ideas kind of echo and repeat, and they're common with humans in general. These may be the first inklings of the beginnings of these kinds of thoughts about divinity and deities. You know what I hear every time I go to the dentist for a checkup? <laughs> no, what? I'm doing it wrong. Doing what wrong? Everything, I guess. It starts with <laughs> brushing my teeth. The truth is most of us are brushing our teeth wrong, not for long enough, or we forget to change our brush on time. And, and that's because most brands focus on selling flashy gimmicks rather than better brushing, but not Quip. Okay, so what makes Quip so different? Well, first of all, Quip is an electric toothbrush that's a fraction of the cost of bulkier brushes while still packing just the right amount of vibrations to help you clean your teeth. And Quip's built-in timer helps you clean for the dentist-recommended two minutes with guiding pulses that remind you when to switch sides. Next, Quip's subscription plans are for your health, not just convenience. They deliver new brush heads on a dentist-recommended schedule every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Wow, you know what? That does sound pretty good. You know what bugs me, though, about my electric toothbrush? It's the base for it. Well, Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel wherever you take your teeth. Wherever I take my teeth? Yeah, everyone loves Quip. They were on Oprah's O-List, named one of Time's best inventions, and Quip is the first subscription electric toothbrush accepted by the American Dental Association. Plus, they're backed by a network of over 20,000 dentists and hygienists, and hundreds of thousands of happy brushers use Quip every day. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash legends right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash legends, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash legends it's summertime here in the northern hemisphere and you know what that means right summer vacations wait what, what's that i hear it's where you get to stop working for a week or two and just enjoy some time with your family in a fun location uh yeah i have no idea what you're talking about uh, but what i do know is that a lot of people take time off from work and if they've been around a while on the job they could have a lot of time built up so if you're a business owner that means being short staff for a week or two or maybe even more well, I have a one-stop, easy, and effective solution for that. You can go right now to ZipRecruiter.com slash legends. That's right. You know, I've witnessed firsthand how the wrong temp worker, or even a long-term staffer, can do a lot of damage to a business's workflow or even its reputation. And I know you got to find someone fast, but you really don't want to mess around with the wrong employees because your business may never recover. And that's where ZipRecruiter comes in. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And with results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. Heck, that new hire will be so good, you'll probably want to keep them. And right now, Astonishing Legends listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash legends. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash L-E-G-E-N-D-S. One last time, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash legends. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. 
If you've gotten this far in the show, consider yourself hooked. Kiss your free time goodbye. Now, let's get back to Scott and Forrest. Here's the thing about the Watchers, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, whatever you want them to be. In the newer Star Trek movies, I can't remember, the first, <laughs> I think it was the second one that opens yeah. down on the planet. And they're down there trying to save the planet from a volcanic explosion yes, or something like that. the very that. pale people with, the, uh, with right. the childlike puppy dog eyes, yes. Right, so the, the Prime Directive says you can't interfere, you can't show this technology. It's the same idea. You don't show this modern technology to these races. You let them develop on their own, these species. Because yeah. you're going to mess and them up, yeah. Of course, at the end, as they're saving the planet, they get spotted and their ship gets spotted, tearing off into the sky, which right. just that one sighting changes everything. Because now they're worshiping that shape in the sky. Yes. The great bird. Yes. Yeah. So that's the idea. Now, if a comet does that, then that's a natural idea. But if a person comes down and says, hey, you know what? Look at this. If you take a, the tincture and you put this under your eyes, your eyes are going to be real pretty. And then um, check this thing out. You can stab somebody with it. And if you stab <laughs> them right here, they'll be dead. So yeah. there's all that kind of stuff. Now, for instance, on page 126 of his book, Collins says, quote, it is not known whether Halley's comet graced our skies in the 10th or 11th millennium BC, although some sources do suggest that it has been in its current orbit for between 16,000 and 200,000 years. All right, so think about that knowledge. It's coming around every 75 years or so, I believe. Imagine if you had a race of beings that knew this, that they had this knowledge had been passed down generationally, and maybe they'd also survived some kind of cataclysmic event, or maybe there was no cataclysm, but they knew that Halley's Comet was going to come around, and that was enough to freak people out. And then they came along and said, I'm telling you, next year, this thing is going to happen in the sky. That would essentially be nothing short of magic for a culture that wasn't aware of it or that hadn't connected that it was a recurring celestial event because it was 75 years apart. And you can imagine that's four or five generations at this time. So if they're coming in with that knowledge and suggesting it could be a way to seize power or to be worshipped or to share information. Because the other thing I think that's interesting, and this is not Collins, this is me, but when you talk about Gobekli Tepe and what it's for and animal husbandry and cultivation of crops and the idea of all that stuff being connected. We're talking about it in a kind of a very benevolent sense, but it didn't necessarily have to be benevolent. Maybe it wasn't because these are humans we're talking about here. And as we said at the top of the show, we're all human and we all know that in tribal cultures, there's war, there's people who are power hungry, there's all kinds of things that might have gone into effect. So it's more than just saying, hey, guess what? If you put a pen up over here and put the animals in it, you won't have to hunt anymore. And check this weed out. Put it over here. If you put water here and do this, then this, you can just grow it right here and you don't have to hunt around and eat individual wheat stalks. You could say all that, but is whoever's saying that doing that out of the goodness of their heart? It's a good question. I don't know. So right. when you evaluate all the things that might have happened, you do have to look at the possibility of some race of humanity taking advantage of another race. Like that's never happened, right? And continues <laughs> to happen. So there's that whole thing to think about when you're looking at the big picture. However, again, I do want to come back to the idea of Halley's Comet. That's a cyclical thing. We don't know for sure that it was coming around, but it, it could have been. There's also events that were maybe surprises, like a comet and maybe a comet coming down and causing a large catastrophic event all over the planet, killing animals, wiping out the sun, that sort of thing. And one of the authors that Andrew Collins talks about in his book, and we've brought him up before, is U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly. And he wrote this book in 1883 called Ragnarok, sound familiar, The Age of Fire <laughs> and Gravel. Yeah. Now, Congressman Donnelly, apparently, he researched historical stories from around the world in multiple cultures, and he specifically cited in his book an event in Norse culture that blacked out the sky all over the planet with noxious air, darkness, and then, you guessed it, a flood of astronomical proportions, which in turn put out fires that were burning globally while also drowning humanity nearly out of existence. And that's in Norse culture. Now, these stories usually include survivors who live because they either hid in a cave or boarded a vessel of some kind. Does that sound familiar? Sounds familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So there's reason to believe that maybe there was some kind of cataclysm of this nature near the end of the last major ice age around 10,900 B.C., but also the beginning of a new 1,300-year mini ice age, again known as the Younger Dryas period. Could that ice age have been brought about by a nuclear winter resulting from a large planetary collision between the Earth and one large or maybe even thousands or millions of small interstellar objects? Collins quotes Donnelly's book in his own book, 
Quote, what else can mankind think of or dream of or talk of for the next thousand years but this awful, this unparalleled calamity through which the race has passed? End quote. And so he goes on to speculate on how ancient people would have wrapped their heads around this, equating the disaster with something they can understand. After all, how does the sky even work? Carvings have shown a reverence for wolves and other cunning predatory animals. Might these ancient people have thought that some celestial version of this creature was responsible for raining destruction down on the earth and then have gone to work trying to worship and appease that ceremonially to keep it from happening again? Going back to the front of the one slab there, and I think enclosure D, which is the most developed enclosure, that's why we're talking about it, it's the most developed and, and impressive, the one figure that has... The front of the belt buckle, it, the belt looks like it's made out of those H shapes, vertical and on their sides, 90 degrees. In the center, the belt buckle looks like it has that U shape. Within the U shape, it's kind of like a fat W shape. I'm looking at a picture of it now. And that's thought to possibly be a graphical representation of a comet. Hanging below that is what's taken to be a loincloth. But it's a fox pelt, it looks like, with the bottom half of the fox pelt. So the legs are hanging down. There's a, a bushy tail. What Collins and others have taken this to possibly mean is that the fox imagery here is important, that it could have just been a square of fur or something, you know, covering uh, your lower bits. But the fact that it's a half of a fox pelt with a bushy tail, also the tail is often described on these animals as resembling the tail of a comet different kind of uh, fiery patterns that come off the tail of a comet in prongs of three or more. Also, you're right, there's uh, something really important about foxes. Some of the pillars have carvings of leaping foxes on them, not just one or two, but uh, but several. There are images also of like snarling, possibly canine, some kind of wolf on these slabs. And so looking at the mythical importance of that, often the heavens are said by cultures later on from these hunter-gatherers here, that the heavens are basically under threat by a giant cosmic mythical wolf or a trickster fox. But basically, if the fox or this canine gets loose, then it's going to chew up heaven and bad things are going to happen. So yes, it's kind of trick or outwit the fox or the wolf to keep it appeased or maybe give it some offering here and that it won't rain down uh, fire and death upon people's because that made a big impact with them for the last 1,300 years. That imagery of the fox or the wolf has figured prominently then at that site and forever after. So there's this site in Syria called Tel Abu Huraira. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. If I'm not, please <laughs> forgive me. And we'll remind you that yeah, a tell is a hill or a mound. Yes, it's a sacred man-made built up of dirt and refuse over uh, centuries and millennia. And so about 12 feet down into the soil there, a team of 18 international researchers found what they call microspherules and other traces of some kind of large past event that would have required extremely high temperatures to create upwards of 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,000 degrees Celsius. The study of this material by this group ruled out volcanoes being the cause, but also showed that 90% of the material definitely came from Earth. Sorry, Giorgio Suclos. It also showed... <laughs> that they were created by high-energy interparticle collisions and are consistent with tiny pieces of molten glass found at Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is left over from an impact of about 50,000 years ago. By the way, if you've ever been there, it's an amazing place. I've been a couple you've of times. You've been there. This is, yeah. Yes, outside of Flagstaff. Did you go down into um, the center of the crater? No, it, you don't realize how big it is. Oh, that no, is a I, major journey. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't I, even think they let you do it anymore. I think you Starman did yeah. it. Remember, he yeah. met his spaceship there in the movie Starman. Exactly. Yeah, it is, you don't realize how big it is, and it was caused by a single nickel-iron meteorite about 54 yards across, they think, traveling at 12 miles per second. Yeah. It actually says on Wikipedia here, it was not until 1960 that later research by Eugene Merle Shoemaker, whose name you should recognize, confirmed a man named Barriger's hypothesis about the meteorite. The key discovery was the presence in the crater of the minerals cosite and stichovite, rare forms of silica found only where quartz-bearing rocks have been severely shocked by an instantaneous overpressure, cannot be created by volcanic action, the only known mechanisms of creating it is naturally through an impact event or artificially through a nuclear explosion. 
So Shoemaker was uniquely aware of this as he had been researching the shocked mineral formations that were formed after the nuclear detonation testing in the Nevada desert. Yeah, at Trinity site. Exactly. Yeah. So they can figure all this together. So you can see how scientists can figure out what creates this type of s- substance. Now, listen to this quote from Andrew Collins on what those scientists said about the evidence they found. Quote, because these three sites in North America and the Middle East, this is where they found the soil with the microspherules in it and other material, by the way, that all pointed to what they thought was an impact event. Because these three sites in North America and the Middle East are separated by 1,000 to 10,000 kilometers, we propose that there were three or more major impact airburst centers for the Younger Dryas Boundary Impact Event. By the way, when they say Younger Dryas Boundary, they're talking about the preceding ice age, which is the Alorod. I'm not sure how you say it, but it's Mm A-L-L-E-R-O-D. The Alorod Ice Age, which ended, and then the Younger Dryas period butts up against that. And there's an older Dryas. There's actually a few Dryas periods, two or three of them. But the boundary represents the time period between those two. So we propose that there were three or more major impact airburst centers for the Younger Dryas Boundary Impact Event. If so, the much higher concentration of this material at Abu Huraira suggests that the effects on that settlement and its inhabitants would have been severe. So again, this is all timing out to the beginning of a 1,300-year mini ice age. And it would appear that Enclosure D, the oldest one at Gobekli Tepe, was built not too long after this. So to recap, what seems to be happening here is that there does seem to be some sort of trace amounts of evidence, you could say, geologic evidence in these microspherals of an impact happening, some kind of massive heat generation caused by, you know, a massive event, unlike normal processes on Earth. That's one theory is that this doesn't happen with volcano, can't generate that kind of heat. The only thing that kind of comes close is possibly a lightning strike, but as some have pointed out, the radius of the area in which these microspherals are found and things like fulgurite formations on the ground when you have this high heat is much smaller. We're talking about larger dispersal patterns of microspherals and evidence of something impacting the Earth or maybe an airburst of a broken up comet. Something acted upon the soil in a large area and had a lasting effect. Now, not everybody believes that, right? Right, and this is a team of 18 researchers who found this. This is what they think, and it's not clear to me. I don't believe these particular microspherals were found in what's known as the Ucello horizon, which is something that we've mentioned a few times here. Collins is careful to not make that connection too closely. He's saying it's very interesting in the in this parallel because a lot of people don't believe that it covers, you know, the Earth globally. Right. But they're very similar. He says the Ucello horizon is a charcoal-rich layer measuring eight inches in thickness or 20 centimeters that has been detected at the Alorod Younger Dryas boundary at sites in the Netherlands, France, Germany, Belgium, Belarus, Poland, India, South Africa, Egypt, and Australia. So whatever's going on, whether you're talking about this particular find of microspheros or not, there is evidence of a global situation that is creating, in the case of the Ucello horizon, nanodiamonds. So there is a counterpoint because we always go with multiple sources when we're doing research like this. And I wanted to find if there was, because for me, this is really fascinating. Just the idea that Gebekli Tepe might have been built as some kind of response to a cataclysmic event, as a message from the past to the future, and possibly from a culture that survived that event to another culture that maybe didn't know about it or something like that. Even though there are professors who poo-poo this idea, it's so compelling to me. So I wanted to see, after we looked at Colin's book, if there were counterpoints to this. And then I found this paper that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and this appeared in March of 2012, The title of the paper is Nano Diamonds and Wildfire Evidence in the Ucello Horizon Post-Date the Alarod Younger Dryas Boundary. So their point is they're saying that these cannot be connected to what brought on the Younger Dryas mini ice age. The people that wrote this paper, God help me, (laughs) Annelies van Hosella, Hmm. Wim Z. Hokbe, Freak Bradbarta, Johannes van der Plicht, D. (laughs) Right. Jillian M. Panaka, and Martine, thank God, oh, Martine. You, yeah. Martine R. Druria. These are the folks that wrote this paper. I wanted to properly credit them. Well, now, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> maybe I may not have It may have been more of a tribute for you not <laughs> to try and pronounce their names, but uh, no, I yeah, applaud yeah, your efforts. Anyway. Yes. Again, so this is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, March 2012. Now, this paper is super complex. We're posting a link to it, but the long and short of it 
is this team took a look at the nanodiamonds from the Ucello horizon. And this is different, I think, than the layer referred to just a few minutes ago with the microspherules, but there's an implied connection. And the Ucello horizon is often cited as proof of a series of impact events that precipitated the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age. So listen to these excerpts from this paper. I tried to just pull the stuff that you should be able to understand now if you've been following along at home. The controversial Younger Dryas impact hypothesis suggests that at the onset of the Younger Dryas an extraterrestrial impact over North America caused a global catastrophe. The main evidence for this impact, after the other markers proved to be neither reproducible nor consistent with an impact, is the alleged occurrence of several nanodiamond polymorphs, including the proposed presence of lonsdalite, a shock polymorph of diamond. We examined the Ucello soil horizon at Geldrop Alsterhout in the Netherlands, which formed during the Alarod early Younger Dryas and would have captured such impact material. Our accelerator mass spectrometry, radiocarbon dates of 14 individual charcoal particles are internally consistent and show that wildfires occurred well after the proposed impact. In addition, we present evidence for the occurrence of cubic diamond and glass-like carbon. No lons delight was found. The relation of the cubic nanodiamonds to glass-like carbon, which is produced during wildfires, suggests that these nanodiamonds might have formed after rather than at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Our analysis thus provides no support for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, there's two more sections I want to read to you here. The exact cause of the onset of the Younger Dryas is still debated. Firestone, who is a professor that we've actually referred to on the show before, proposed that an extraterrestrial impact over the North American ice sheet was not only the cause of the rapid cooling, but also resulted in worldwide high-temperature biomass burning, North American megafaunal extinction, and the disappearance of the human Clovis culture. Evidence for this hypothesis has been under severe scrutiny ever since. Most lines of evidence have proven to be not reproducible or not unique to an impact. And they actually go on to elucidate that. You can read the paper if you want to read about that. One of the more promising lines of evidence for the impact hypothesis is the alleged occurrence of nanodiamonds and Alarod YD for Younger Dryas boundary sediments. All right, so this is the last section. These are the conclusions. One more paragraph. Bear with me, folks. I I think this is interesting. (laughs) Hopefully you do too. You probably already clicked stop. Our work follows two lines of research on the carbonaceous fraction of the Ucello horizon associated with the proposed YD impact event. TEM analysis of glass-like carbon shows that although cubic nanodiamonds are present, there is no sign of the shock polymorph Lonsdalite. Furthermore, Although the formation of the Ucello horizon started during the Alarod, our critical dating places the wildfire episode up to two centuries after the proposed impact event and into the Younger Dryas. Moreover, our nanodiamonds are two centuries younger than the diamonds reported by Kennett et al., indicating that unless two impacts happened in a short period of time, one or both of the cubic diamond populations must have a non-impact origin. Because the glass-like carbon in which the nanodiamonds were found is known as a wildfire product. The nanodiamonds might in some way be related to wildfires instead. We therefore conclude that although our findings cannot exclude the possibility of an impact, we found no evidence in the Ucello horizon to support the YD impact hypothesis. So that's their conclusionary paragraph, which may have been the only one I understood. So the, the, <laughs> the sum that up for us, will you? Okay. To sum that up, yeah. what's happening here is they looked at the nanodiamonds in the Ucello horizon, that one that we just mentioned has been found all over the world that suggests possible multiple impacts on the planet and supports this cataclysmic idea. Right. They looked at that and they found that the materials in it, specifically these nanodiamonds, were not consistent with what would have been produced had there been an impact event. Mm-hmm. They determined that they were likely produced by wildfires. And on top of that, through dating, they also determined that the Ucello horizon was created almost 200 years after the Younger Dryas Mini Ice Age theoretically started. So if it lasted 1,300 or 1,400 years, which is about what they think, then they're saying it started 200 years into it, which would not be connected to an impact. An impact is not going to start a wildfire 200 years later. So that's their counterpoint. But these other researchers, though, are talking about the microspherals that they found at Abu Huraira. The question is, how do these things all jibe? Who's right? Who's wrong? And they're not ruling out an impact. But I have two questions about this after I looked at this, and I couldn't be less qualified to ask any questions about this paper. (laughs) By the way, I read the whole thing. I retained at least 3% of it. But here's my questions. The phrase, quote, unless two impacts happened in a short period of time, do we have any statistical analysis of the likelihood of that? Why isn't that entirely possible? How could we possibly know 
a prediction model for impacts. It's the universe. We're talking about things coming from deep space. We don't even know if something's coming tomorrow. Right. Unless we happen to look in the right part of the sky. So that doesn't discount, though, like a comet splitting up or things breaking apart and forming two impacts. What time of span are they talking about as far as like two different impacts? Well, in within a couple hundred years, okay. they're saying. All right, so a long span So of time, maybe there yeah. was one at the top of the Younger Dryas period, and that's what precipitated it, and then possibly another one right. 200 years into it. Not only, to me, could they be plausible, they could be connected. They could right. be something on the same trajectory. You know, I don't know. Because the universe is huge. 200 years apart is not really that far. It's, yeah, it's nothing. But <laughs> So what you're saying, though, how it ties back... Because I see two different things going on here. When there's a scientist that says, well, Gobekli Tepe has nothing to do with a global catastrophe and nothing to do with like a comet impact, or we shouldn't look at the symbolism on these designs as having anything to do with comets. It's like, well, if you separate those out, it seems like the consensus is that obviously that can happen. We've been hit by large meteorites causing massive holes and tourist attractions in Arizona, and things like this have, have happened before, like Chelbolyinsk. You know, you have yeah. massive explosions, and maybe even Tunguska, you have a something like that with maybe a piece of antimatter on it, which just destroys an entire forest. So these things can happen. So tying this back, though, to Gobekli Tepe is that there's no proof that something like that, which does happen and has happened, had any influence on the building by these people. That they we're trying to make a timeline cohesive here where there's a connection. And some say there could be, and some say there probably isn't. Would that make sense to you? Yeah, that's the gist of okay. it. And this is a case of scientists disagreeing with scientists. And these are really smart people. They just have a different approach based on their studies and then leaping off from their their hunches. Yeah, and the other thing about the paper that's interesting to me is that, <laughs> so they're like, okay, well, there's no impact. The part that they slough over, because the only point of the paper was to determine whether or not the nano diamonds found in the Ucello horizon were related to impacts exactly. or multiple right. global impacts. Right. So they're just like, yeah, there's no impacts. But there were global wildfires. Anyway, over here, I'm like, okay, I, and I know that wasn't the point of that paper, but like, <laughs> yeah. all right, so there wasn't an impact, but the entire planet's on fire. What's going on there? Right, Like, right. what did cause that? And that's still a cataclysmic event, even if it wasn't caused by an impact. And that's something that we can get to when talking about Robert Schock, who was on uh -huh. Joe Rogan yeah. just a few weeks ago, right? Absolutely, which is funny. He does talk about GT a little bit and kind of spurs throughout the middle and towards the end. But really, his thing is about dating the Sphinx. That's what he's known for. But he does talk about the erosion patterns and the minerals that are found. And the other thing is that he's a geologist. So this is his specialty here. But talking about possible massive worldwide wildfires... And what leads to his theory is that there was some kind of massive coronal mass ejection event that happens. I think even Joe Rogan said, like, well, could it have been a comet? And he said, well, it, yeah, it could be a comet hitting the sun, causing a disruption and massive solar flares. It could have been partly a comet or pieces of a comet hitting the Earth plus a CME event. It could have been a bunch of things, but he does think that there were insanely violent lightning storms all around the world at this time or from this event, something like the Carrington event, which we talked about, you know, in the 1850s. And in that event, people reported seeing electricity dancing along telegraph lines, as, as we've said before, and telegraph operators at the operator's end getting shocks. You don't see these rays coming down, but that's what's happening. It's causing such electromagnetic disturbance that you're seeing sparks, folks. So, Dr. Shock is thinking that there could have been a, such a tremendous amount of lightning storms that people took cover and it freaked them out and started fires and killed off a, a lot of fauna and flora and it made an impact on these people. And I don't think that he goes to tying that to Gebekli Tepe, but that's what we're talking about here is that something that's global, worldwide, multicultural at that time being remembered for generations and generations afterwards and trying to be prevented again spiritually. And he also talks about the idea of a series of comets impacting both the sun and the earth at the same time. Yeah, that was the other interesting thing that I mentioned in part two that he mentioned was that this activity could cause really wild, trippy, aurora borealis types of effects and visuals in the sky that would probably freak out early man. 
and women, you know, because it was so ramped up that you'd see patterns. I mean, we look at them now, we see pictures all the time, of course, you go to the North Pole, and they're beautiful to look at, but that's normal activity. When it's really crazy, think about the messages that these Neolithic people would have in their minds, like, what are the gods showing us? This is crazy, and trying to make a note of that and tell their kids about later for generations on end. So, it's possible. It makes a lot of sense. That's his line of thinking. But of course, there's a lot of people who, who don't go there, that uh, they're separating these events out. And here's the bottom line. You can see we're getting close to maybe understanding what might have happened back then. And honestly, I think a greater grasp on all this is seriously just around the corner. I think maybe in our lifetime. And Klaus Schmidt, who was the father of all the major discoveries at Gebekli Tepe, thought that even if there was an impact that happened 1,300 or 1,400 years ago was too long to be remembered. So he didn't think it would have influenced the builders of Gebekli Tepe. But check this out. Andrew Collins points out that even though Schmidt thought there wouldn't have been a connection across 1,400 years, there is evidence from ice cores taken in Greenland that show super high levels of ammonium in the atmosphere around 12,900 years ago, which lines up with the supposed impact event that would have triggered the younger Dryas. But, and here's the kicker, those ammonium levels and those ice cores in Greenland shoot up again 560 years later, around 10,340 BC, as well as high nitrate levels, which would indicate, again, wildfires. This is according to Dr. Firestone, again, who we referred to in the paper of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory of Nuclear Science. So that would mean that there were two impact events, and one of them is now only 850 years prior to the oldest currently known construction at Quebecli Tepe. So the paper states that the evidence of fires and evidence of an impact do not connect, but now you know both sides of that idea because these ice cores in Greenland are showing the possibility of either two impact events or two series of fires, which then we could go back to Dr. Schock and say, maybe these fires were the results of Carrington event type of coronal mass ejections instead of an impact, if you can't say that it's an impact. Either way, you're still looking at a cataclysm, because if you're starting to rule out cataclysms and connections to Gobekli Tepe, you're also throwing out mythology from around the world, from literally hundreds, if not thousands of cultures, that talk about a cataclysm as their starting point. Right. That's the part of it that's post-processual, I guess, because we're saying, oh, well, you know, let's look at the Bible, let's look at these stories that these people told and that were handed down about a cataclysm, but, well, that's not science, but is it just a game of telephone across <laughs> oh, thousands of years? <laughs> You know, well, you're talking I, about multiple discovery, right? Uh, yeah, uh, phenomenon. yeah, it's yeah. interesting to me. Okay, so when we look at the myths, the symbolism that's going on at Gobekli Tepe, you wonder then, where did this come from? And actually, I'm wondering also, how do they do the engineering? We're still not sure about that. And it could have been developed by them, themselves, these hunter-gatherers, but you also have to consider they're not really used to this kind of thing. They weren't building and carving stone structures. Obviously, they were making flint tools. We know that. But to erect these structures and massive ones that they had to stand upright and build a ceremonial temple of sorts, yeah, they could have done that. But you're wondering then, did they have help? And also, were they motivated by something and some peoples or some things? So then the question comes up, what we mentioned before, is it representative, these two main pillars, the focus of all this construction, of some kind of strange humanoid people or beings, and are they physical or are they spiritual? And if you look at it and tie that into following spiritual stories about the Watchers from the Book of Enoch and the Old Testament, and where did those tales come from? Are they grounded in actual real people that were seen in an angelic-like presence? Now, Here's an interesting connection. So then you're wondering, like, well, what kind of people perhaps did these hunter-gatherers come across that would influence them, that would oppress upon them as being advanced and elite, that they should follow their lead or start these projects on their recommendation? And as we hinted at before, they may have looked totally different. So that's another big part of the style design going on at Gobekli Tepe is that these don't look like regular humans. And so what are we talking about here when you say the Watchers? Well, one idea that Collins proposed is that these may have been early migratory reindeer herders and hunters of the Swiderian culture, correct? 
Yeah. And that culture offshoots into lots of other cultures. But here's what's really interesting. The reason that these people look unusual is that there is an idea that they were interbred between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Exactly. Yeah. And this is producing a pronounced brow ridge, a longer, thinner, angular face. And they also might have been very tall and strong. And very pale. And and pale. As also described that the watchers have from the the ancient writings we know, they said a piercing stare. Their eyes were uh, very arresting perhaps beady, set in a long face that was snake-like. Yes, serpent-like. And that's really fascinating. So they would have had a very commanding presence, really. That's the idea behind this. And could these people have become known as the Watchers? Could this have been a small, separate group of Homo sapiens that had developed on its own and maybe in an insular way, but as a result had become something that was arresting to these other groups that they would meet. And if they came bringing knowledge, say, for example, what we talked about earlier, if they brought knowledge of the return of Halley's Comet or of a a cataclysmic event that happened before or how to build structures, which, again, the question becomes, if they knew how to do that, how come there's not evidence of those that they built somewhere else prior to Gobekli Tepe. I don't know. Right. And, well, the, well and this, again, we are way out on the limb of speculation. Like, <laughs> well, the, no, right the things at the that end we, of the branch. Some of these are based in solid ideas, like the Swedarian uh, culture they know come from the northern parts of Europe, I think ancient Poland, that kind of region, and spread a great distance. It's a long ways from where it's believed they started out from to the plains of Anatolia and Turkey. But how they can track them is the types of flints and spear points and arrow points, arrow heads, that they left in their path. And you could say, you know, one argument could say like, well, they were just migrating and following the game, the herds, but also what ties into this, as we said, it's like this is at the end of a mini ice age where large herds of animals that they would normally be hunting are dying off. They're having trouble because they can find these camps and then they don't find a lot of evidence of bones. So it's not like they're having successful hunts following migratory herds of animals. They're spreading out for a reason. They're traveling to these far-flung regions for them for a purpose, either to get away from something or to just find a new place where there isn't so much toil and uh, a lot more food. And they may have found that in the plains of Anatolia and come across the hunter-gatherers of Gebekli Tepe and looking different, having different clothing, being very pale. They would look much different than the people that were already there. And they may have knowledge that these other hunter-gatherers didn't have, especially, as we said, about celestial movements in the skies and um, mythology and brought some new ideas to them. And so now it's being proposed by some, and, and Collins is wondering this as well, Did they have an influence? Were these the types of people that were considered the watchers who maybe have bestowed some kind of knowledge upon them as they themselves emigrated to these new areas? Yeah. It's interesting because if you have a really kind of an odd looking, strange looking person who's tall and they seem powerful, they look so much different than you, they would seem quote unquote alien to you, you know, in an ancient alien kind of way. Like these people are strange. They have a different language, but they're telling us these things that may or may not have come true, and we should follow their lead. We should build these things they're talking about. We should follow this religion. That happens quite a bit. So that's one theory, and again, it's supported by archaeological finds, the traces that they leave behind, the spread of these cultures into new areas. And so we're trying to answer the question, why would these people do this? And uh, where do they get this information? And where do these ancient legends come from? And this is one possibility. Another really important thing to remember here, you might have remembered that we talked a little bit about Armenia in part two. Right, right. And you can pretty much trace everything that we've mentioned up to this point to what ultimately became Armenia. And there's countless linguistic references to Armenian culture that connect Armenians to this region. Collins points this out. It's one thing to remember is that the Ottoman government in the region rounded up and executed one and a half million Armenians in what is today known as the Armenian Genocide in 1915. Right, right. And this is widely accepted as fact by 28 countries, although modern-day Turkey has still not acknowledged the genocide. Quote, the Turkish Republic does not deny there were deaths, but disputes the 1.5 million figure. 
and that the intent was to eliminate an entire race. Turkey claims the killings were part of a conflict, not a systematic genocidal campaign of murder, and that, quote, the Armenians as a group took up arms against their own government and joined Russian forces. Um, that's from a link that we'll post in our show notes. So as anyone who listens to us knows, we don't really discuss politics on our show. We're not going to start now, but there's a reason this is important when you're thinking about Gobekli Tepe. You have to always consider the filters of the time and a place that may affect how a newly uncovered historical information is processed and evaluated. Point being that Armenia is now a shadow of its former size and stature, and historical findings relating to the ancestors of Armenians can be clouded by this intense conflict that came so much later. Additionally, I thought this was really fascinating. Armenia was actually the first Christian nation in the world adopting Christianity nationwide in the year 301 AD. So politically and theologically, when you make an archaeological discovery that both connects to what were originally the Armenian highlands, as well as Christianity in a now predominantly Muslim country, you might have a difficult time on many levels considering the current government's position on even using the word genocide as well as the fact that we're talking about the origins of Christianity in a country in which the current time, or as of 2016, 82% of its citizens are of the Islamic faith. You really can't look at Gebekli Tepe without understanding how the face of the region has changed, even just in the 20th century. And that's going to be important going forward, because as we talk a little bit here in a second about Andrew Collins, the last part of his journey that he records in his book, that genocide and that conflict will come into play. So we just wanted to point that out. It ties in with historical context, because if you look at just the name, Armenians use Portisar, which I believe refers to navel. In one sense, the Turkish word is pot belly hill or, you know, belly hill. In another sense, you're taking it to mean navel, which it's on the belly. But think about the difference in, in the wording is that the navel represents birth. Right. It is the birthplace of the world, this sacred place to them in the Armenian highlands. And so the way even the naming makes you think about it is different. And that is another central point that Collins makes is that this spot here was considered by the Neolithic peoples, the uh, PPNA peoples, as possibly being a spot that is sacred, the center pole of the world and of the heavens. And that transfers down into the Armenian culture in a way. So these are the bigger ideas that this place represents. The center of the world, a kind of a thin place is what we talked about before, between our everyday world and the spiritual world. And these ceremonies may have been performed by shaman who could be guides, as it often is in many cultures, to take the initiates, the worshipers, through this journey and touch the other side of the heavens and figure out what's going on and possibly do some working to adjust it so, you know, a major catastrophe didn't happen again. And if you don't want to go the major catastrophe route, perhaps just as religious worship to our ancestors, the soul portal part of this, uh, the soul door aspect of these kind of uh, monuments, that is a thin place. It's a portal to the other side. So again, you can take whatever parts of these you want to make it work, depending on, what, on how you want to go. Either it's a monument to a catastrophe and the gods, or just the gods, or just a catastrophe. We don't know, but these are some really interesting connections that kind of paint the bigger picture here. So as we're wrapping this up, I did want to talk about a couple of final things. Part of Andrew Collins' final journey in his book, which is really interesting. And we have talked about his book a lot, but I guarantee you it's only about 5% of it. You really do need to check it out. Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods. Um, find it if you can, because if this is interesting to you at all, it's like uh, Forrest said, there's people who call it a masterwork on it. It's really interesting, both from a scientific and a speculative standpoint and everywhere you can go. But one of the things that he goes on a great deal about, and by the way, the parallels between all of this stuff and what J.R.R. Tolkien did in the Lord of the Rings is not lost on me. The, the biblical connections, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, yeah. The journeys, the mountains, right. all of that stuff. There's a whole long discussion about the place of the descent, which is about where the ark wound up yes. after the uh, flood receded. And how, while the modern world considers that Mount Ararat, originally, even by the Armenian culture, it was considered to be a different mountain, Mount Judy, J-U-D-I. and. Right. There's reasonable evidence, according to Collins, that that was the more likely place, including the settlement at the base of that mountain that, in theory, is the one that Noah's family established after the descent. So there's a lot of interesting information in the book about that. 
of the other things he talks about is these cultures that controlled obsidian because obsidian, this volcanic glass was very rare, but it was also, once they had learned how to fashion it into the points or arrowheads or weapons, they realized that it never needed sharpening, that it was incredibly, incredibly sharp. You could sharpen it to a, the point of a scalpel. And yeah, actually you can, that, yeah, you could operate with it. Right. So if you could control that material, it was a magical substance that would bring food to hunters. It became the thing. It was, it would have been more valuable than gold at the time, because if you had these obsidian points, then you could get so much more done with so much less work. And you know, that's technology. That's what technology is. The question again, did the watchers bring this technology to people before they were ready? And who were the watchers? Were they supernatural or did they just have advanced knowledge? One of the things that I think is particularly interesting that Collins talks about is the serpent-like appearance of these folks. And then he goes on so far as to mention a watcher, a fallen angel named Gadriel. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. G-A-D-R-E-E-L. And it's got 75 different accents on it, but he goes to talk about how Gadriel is the one that tempted Eve. And so there's this whole possibility, the suggestion that instead of literally it being a serpent that tempted Eve, it was a watcher or these people that might have been known as walking serpents. So there's a whole fascinating thing there about what led up to the fall. If you take the actual idea of a snake out of it and make that a, an allegorical representation. That, I mean, there's a whole, say, I can't get into it. It's all, you know, frankly, I'm not <laughs> qualified to be talking about it, but getting towards the end of the book, and this is what I thought was actually particularly courageous of Andrew Collins. He makes no bones about mentioning, but he essentially says that he had a dream mm-hmm. while he was, you know, working in this area, working on the book. He'd been to Turkey several times. You know, he interviewed Klaus Schmidt before he passed away. He's done all this work on this, and he had a dream, and in this dream, he saw these monks at a monastery And he dreamed that it was in that region, and they were holding up or venerating some kind of relic that he couldn't make out, but they were holding it up to the sky, and there was some kind of ceremony. He became convinced that this monastery was a real place. And as his journey unfolded to try and find this place, he began to believe that it existed in the Garden of Eden. Now, what's fascinating about this, and this is not right at Gebekli Tepe, the area that he's looking at is about 200 miles, I believe, to the east, but not very far in the grand scheme of things. So he begins to seek out this monastery. He goes through all this legwork. He's talking to people on the internet. He's using Google Earth, uh, Google Maps, and trying to find it. And eventually he does find this structure. And when he gets there, he makes a very, very compelling case for it having been resting in a corner of the Garden of Eden. And According to the lore that he heard from locals and from research that he did, this monastery had a relic that was a piece of the tree of life, the evergreen, the tree that was planted all those years ago. And when he got to this particular monastery, which he talks about in the book, there was a 2,000-year-old walnut tree, and he saw this on the satellite image. I think the satellite image he looked at was from 2012 or something, and he got there in 2014 maybe or sometime like that. Don't quote me exactly on it, but by the time he got there, he's looking at the monastery, which is now just kind of a foundation, and there's not much left because it was destroyed in the aforementioned Armenian genocide. And so whatever might have been there was completely gone other than these, you know, what's left of these destroyed walls. And then he asked about the tree that was there, this tree of life, which would have been a representation not of the original tree because that would have been so long ago, but another tree that supposedly was planted in the same spot. He gets back to where this 2,000-year-old walnut tree is supposed to be, and it's been cut down. It's a five-foot stump. It's just gone. And he was heartbroken. He asked the locals about it, and they said, oh, yeah, it fell down two years ago, and it took two trucks to haul it off. And he talks about being saddened by the way it was treated. You know, and supposedly that relic was buried at the base of it. So it's so fascinating. And and the fact that he talks in his book about having had a dream, and this dream took him to this real place that he found, and he stood out and looked from it and imagined what the world would have looked like back then, and he really did feel like perhaps he was in the mythical Garden of Eden. And it's hard to say he wasn't. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure there's many people that would dispute what he said, but he was in the right region. He talks for chapters and chapters about 
the disputed location of it. Obviously, there's many different schools of thought on where it is, but he makes a very good case for it having been in the area he was at. So I would encourage you to get his book, check it out. If you then start to go the biblical route, and also uh, the mythological route, as, it, as we said before, it's the ancient forbidden knowledge that is not supposed to go to humans, somehow being passed to these Neolithic peoples, these hunter-gatherers, that suddenly springs forth a Neolithic revolution. Hopefully you're seeing the whole big picture here, is that suddenly everyone goes from being a hunter-gatherer to being a farmer taking care of animals, harvesting cereals, and doing it correctly, like using fatter grains so they all don't fall off onto the ground. You can get a bigger yield. They're more nutritious. There's a change here that's pretty rapid, which, again, most classified as this Neolithic revolution. But what sparked it? Where did people get this knowledge? Was it one of the catalysts here that, you know, is the big idea behind Gebekli Tepe, as we said in part one, that... It's the urge to do this kind of worship, to make this kind of place, this kind of temple that sparks actually needing to grow food and settle down to accomplish this feat rather than the other way around, that somehow you just start to decide that you're going to be a farmer and then religion and worship comes after that. So that's one idea that this place in and of itself has turned on its head or turned around. But it gets really, really fringy for a lot is that, again, you start to make these biblical connections. And so that goes off way into the aspects of the Old Testament, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, you know, texts that were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that this ancient knowledge coming from Adam's son, Seth, about farming. And also, we mentioned this again, everything, everything ties together. This goes back to Oak Island and the Book of Enoch, and that possibly Enoch's eight chambers that he had built underground to preserve the ancient knowledge handed down, possibly by the Watchers, in the eighth chamber below. Is that what Oak Island is? You know, you start to wonder, and also the Golden Delta, the name of God that's on there. And so you start to look at these kind of way out ideas, but also there are similarities there, which are just pretty fascinating. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that that's where the book kind of goes when it starts to do its conclusions. It's been mentioning throughout in that there are these definite connections. You can make these parallels to ancient biblical stories. So those are the big mysteries, the puzzle pieces here, in that you have something that probably shouldn't have been built at this time being built by people who shouldn't have known how to do that yet. But there you go, you can't argue with that. And also, what we're beginning to come to as fact is that it sparks civilization. So we got those facts, but where did this come from? Was it just another slightly more advanced race of people? Was it a race of people that were hybrids of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens? If you want to get biblical, was it a hybrid of humanoid people and some kind of angelic spirits in that they were the Watchers, the forefathers of the Nephilim? So there's different ideas of what it is and how it was done and why, depending on, you know, your personal beliefs and and what you were trained in, if that's your area of expertise, if you were a geologist or an archaeologist or an anthropologist. Let me ask you, Scott, like, what are the big remaining questions for you? Because you can see that it got smaller, and they weren't as elaborate. Was this a faith that kind of died down as people did become more skilled with farming and stuff? And then why was it filled in? Were they done with it? That's a really good question. And we'll remind our listeners, if they don't remember, we talked about this in part one, I think, but that the enclosures, as time went on, as they get into the more recent past, got smaller and smaller and smaller. It's almost like a spinal tap joke because you start out <laughs> this huge triptych, and then at the end, it's only like four feet tall. It's ridiculous. So right. these T's, they're not technically triptychs, but they were in spinal tap. But my point is that the T's, the T pillars are yeah. getting smaller and smaller. The enclosures are getting smaller. What is that about? They seem to be backfilled to preserve them and backfilled very quickly, meaning filled with dirt and all kinds of, there's bones mixed in with it. They're just like covering it up. And so there's a couple of questions about that. Like you just said, maybe whatever the idea of it was fell out of favor. Maybe there was a warring culture that came along and had threatened to destroy it. So they did it to hide it. Look at what's happening now with ISIS destroying these ancient cities of like Palmyra. 
they yes, they come exactly. through and they wipe it clean because they don't want any trace of that. So yeah, it was were they seeing something a, a shift like we don't get enough enough people to work on these as we did hundreds of years ago or a thousand years ago this is all we could scrape up. But now if we just covered in with dirt, they had the foresight that someone some generation thousands of years from now we'll find it and guess what that's what happened well and we've read in even in the sources of research that we've done even today there's probably less interest in it in the region of turkey because it is not necessarily part of the origins of the islamic faith right right and i'm not saying there's any sort of deliberate action going on but we did read in the course of this story that maybe it was a little more difficult to get assistance with it and to preserve it and to get security for it because it doesn't connect even now today with the group that's in power there in terms of their own personal beliefs and religious beliefs. So yeah, it's the same thing the, that Robert Schock said about the Sphinx and Egypt is that there's differing opinions about uh, what it means and its importance by the people who live there. And also there's always, as he said, always a political angle about, uh, well, who's going to dig this up? It belongs to us. We want to do it. Or do we let other foreign outside teams come in and do it? So there's a political and there's a religious angle to all this today. If you're the current power, you want to control the narrative, right. whether it's for good or bad, that's your goal. And you have to keep that in mind. So what this place represents is some of the very first human narratives in, in, in human history that we have come across so far. You know, aside from cave paintings, again, that we mentioned before, the ones found in France, which are 15 to 20 to maybe 30,000 years old, some of the earliest so far that we found, there's a change in style, but still there seems to be a spiritual and uh, meaningful representation, not just a snapshot of like what we killed today. There could be a cosmic connection. There definitely seems to be of some sort in the images you find. 10,000 years before Gebekli Tepe. So what I got from this book, and, and stop me if you want to add anything, but this is what I see is the through line since these earliest times of people who lived in caves and came out of the caves and were doing more hunting and gathering and got a little more sophisticated. If you back that up, and that's always been fascinating to me, it's like, what is the earliest, earliest point? Let's go back further than the Sumerians. Let's go back further than the Egyptians. Let's go back to where there's no cities yet. And what do we have? And this seems to be the first evidence of a communal gathering for something other than just nomadic hunting. So when we start there and these narratives get built or we start to decipher them, you start to figure out like, well, no, obviously when they built this, they had an idea of a myth or a story or something that's been handed to them of where they come from, where our place is in the universe and on earth and in between. There's been thinking about that. So now as we see either that knowledge has been given to them possibly, or they developed it on their own. You know, it makes me wonder, it's like when you have an idea of a soul that it goes somewhere, like where did people come up with that? If you were a cave person, it's not like when you killed something, you see a white mist come up and it looks like a ghost and it floats up into the heavens. So that's where we know they go. They go flying up into the stars. Is it because of this phenomenon that you don't have to believe in ghosts, but you might think that there is a phenomenon that people see spirits of some kind or think that they do, even if you don't think that they exist, but people are, have been seeing something spiritual connected with death and people who have passed on and ancestors since the very beginning of people. So how do you get the idea of a soul then? If you don't see anything generally, Maybe it's because people have been seeing ghosts. Maybe that's the first start when we start to think spiritually about this. And then what happens since the first times that people can communicate, in which we're walking upright, and now we have a culture that is sophisticated enough to make tools that they can use to build things like this in a group. But who sparked that? So you start there, and like you said, you see this narrative, and you can trace that line all the way to where... You are right now listening to this on whatever device it is, by whatever means, and you think you're that advanced. Well, there is a line, and it's a long line. It's 10,500 years long, and it's 20,000 years, and before that. All throughout that line, it's unbroken, and possibly everything is connected. <laughs> That's
that's going to wrap up our series on Gobekli Tepe. We'll be back next week with a new show about a very different topic. Special thanks to Andrew Collins for writing such a fascinating book and the late Klaus Schmidt for recognizing the importance of the site. We're going to keep an eye on this place. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on at Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Clark. This is Trish. Hi, I'm Zenyu. T-R-I-S-H. And I give permission to Astonishing Legends. Hello, Scott Philbrook. I understand this is with no implied promise. Or Forrest Burgess. Present or future compensation. Or whoever edits these. Our show is edited by Sarah Wendell. And our theme, which is available as a ringtone, is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find us at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends if you'd like to support the show in that way. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. Thank you.